Hi, everybody. As you may know, I recently declared myself an independent candidate for president of the United States. Independent doesn't just mean that I'm independent of the two parties. It also means I'm independent of their traditional funders and all the corporate donors, the big tech, big pharma, Wall Street, the military industrial complex, and all the other ones. But let me tell you who I'm not independent of. I'm not independent of you, and I don't want to be. When I'm president, you, the people, are going to be my boss. You're going to be the ones that I listen to, not the lobbyists, not the influence peddlers, not the whole out of touch culture in Washington, D.C. And that also means that I'm dependent on you to fund my campaign. Those mega corporations, the insiders, that corrupt merger of state and corporate power won't touch me with a 10 foot pole. Instead, I'm relying upon thousands and hundreds of thousands and soon to be millions of small donations from people like you. Close to two thirds of American voters say that they want an alternative to the two party candidates. If you're serious about that, I'd like to ask you to donate to my campaign so we can get on the ballot in all 50 states. Now's the time to show everyone that an independent candidate is for real. My promise to you is that I will bring you an administration that is independent of the corrupt and paralyzed party elites and dependent on the will of the people to completely turn this country around. If you like this video and you want to help me become president of the United States, go to Kennedy24.com and donate now. Talking about the problems with methane. So um, a blade of grass tips over and dies and it rots. It creates methane. A cow can eat that same blade of grass and it produces the same exact methane. So that's like high school biology. However, when it's discussed in Congress, it's cows eating grass are destroying the environment, even though cows eating grass are the environment. So uh, the whole argument sort of false. And now we have pharmaceutical companies that are supporting and sort of the AMA is also supporting this, this idea uh, because they like sick people. They make great customers. Uh, so it's, it's two forces that are pushing to make the most nutritious food available, that being animal protein, either illegal or sanctioned or overtaxed or something like that. What can be done? Like, how can we protect the, the beef industry? Uh, you know, I think what... Um, I, you know, I think there's a new crop of environmentalists who are understanding the importance of uh, keeping animals on the land. And, you know, I, I kind of grew up in that, in, a, in that area because I was, um, I spent a lot of my career suing factory farms. And I probably sued Smithfield more than any other attorney, Tyson's, Purdue, um, uh, Bo Pilgrim, all of the big, you know, Wendell Murphy, all of the big uh, mass, you know, CAFO, concentrated animal feed operations. Sure. And, um, and what's happened is the transformation of land use. And what I think more and more, and so they're now, you know, do, do, dosing the fields with, um, with pesticides and, with, uh, and, and we're not doing what, and with, with um, uh, carbon-based chemicals. You know, fertilizers. Yes. And what we've learned is it's destroying the soils. And that uh, the best thing that you can do for the climate is to have uh, is to have wholesome, rich soils. Right. And the best way to aerate the soil um, and to make sure that it's healthy is by having ungulates on it who are tearing up the the earth with their hooves who are spreading manure on that soil and returning soil health. And when it's a healthy soil, you're, you're absorbing a lot more carbon. So if, you're prim if your primary concern is, is uh, carbon, it solves that problem, but also does a lot of other good things for the environment. It, it helps uh, uh, um, rainwater to permeate the land rather than to run off across the surface. And, you know, which is very, very destructive, not only of soils, but also of the water systems, et cetera. So I think there is a sort of a new, um, 
And when I started making these arguments back in the 90s, they were very novel arguments. People at that time were, you know, were subsumed in the, the carbon-only orthodoxy. That's the you know, only important issue. Right. And what we, I think more and more environmentalists coming up, including you know, one of the leaders of that, that movement is a guy called Charles Eisenstein, who is uh, the messaging director for my campaign. So, you know, I think you've got a whole bunch of people in this campaign who are, uh, are very much in favor of regenerative agriculture, very much against the idea of synthetic foods. Right. Um, and, uh, and other, you know, eating the insects and all the other weird ideas that are coming yeah. from, the, uh, from the corporate klep kleptocracy. Practically unusable protein by the human body, but... Nobody yeah, really talks about. Nobody that. even knows what's in it. I mean, nobody really, really even knows what's in real meat. You know, yeah. I mean, there's so much the of essential it. amino acids, the yeah, vitamin B12. Right. Like you can't survive <laughs> right. for more than seven or eight years without it. Yeah. Now, fortunately for vegans, statistically, they do eat meat when they're drunk, so they'll probably <laughs> do okay long term. But we need to keep healthy food on the shelves at the grocery store. Yeah. Uh, it is so important for America to understand that you understand this. Yeah. Well. Awesome. Done. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. I love that tie. That's it. That's all I got. When the tragedy happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue uh, in October 2018, I found myself there with Rabbi Jeff Myers. Breaking news, deadly church shooting. Tragedy in Charleston. At least nine people killed overnight. Shooting at a church in Charleston, an address that corresponds to the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, this morning, I spoke with, and Vice President Biden spoke with Mayor Joe Riley and other leaders of Charleston to express our deep sorrow over the senseless murders that took place last night. Dylan Roof was self-radicalized as a white supremacist. And as it grew, then it manifested into him carrying out an act after Bible study, after sitting there, listening, hearing, learning, after the prayer. Pastor Manning came here a year after the shootings, and we were talking about his uh, experience in sort of dealing with the PTSD and the trauma that still exists in this community. Because we have failed to have meaningful dialogue, at times, unintended consequences come up. It's easier to have those conversations with our friends, but can we have them with those who are opposite political extremes? Uh, if we can, we, are, we become a better community. If we don't, we will continue to perpetuate the same level of hate and the same level of results with gun violence. Everyone's voice matters. Everyone's background matters. Everyone's history matters. That's why I was referencing earlier with the Emmanuel Nye Memorial. We broke ground already, but the physical work starts in a couple of weeks. And we have two fellowship benches, and those fellowship benches are long white marble. And in the middle of it, you have the names basins of the Emmanuel Nine, those who were murdered here. and. What we have failed to do is have conversations with people, regardless of our background, our political ideologies, whatever the case may be. And is that what the benches symbolize in yeah. this memorial? Yeah, the fellowship benches are just that, uh, an opportunity to sit down and have a conversation. I hope and pray that it, it will begin to change lives. Tall order. I sympathize with, you know, and. And I uh, commend you for taking this community through that difficult time. You know, the only thing I think they, people can hear at a lot of different pressure points in their life is, I love you, I'm here for you, and, and that there are no answers, but we'll process this together and try to process it in a way that's healthy and can find some wisdom in it. Right. The word wisdom means a knowledge of God's will. And often, as you know, pain is the touchstone for spiritual growth. That is correct. Yeah. One of the things that I learned is never tell people exactly that you know how they're feeling. Because you really don't. Everyone's experience is different. And everyone has to be given time, validation, and the assurance.
and at times, as I share with Rabbi Myers, uh, just the ministry of presence, just being there, just listening, just talking. When people die, they leave a big hole in you, and that that hole really doesn't get any smaller. What our job is, is to grow ourselves bigger around the hole yes. uh, by building character. And we do that by taking part of the best virtues of the person who died and trying to incorporate those into our own character. And that way we make ourselves larger and the whole gets proportionally smaller. Yeah. When I memorialize or eulogize uh, people, I say it doesn't get any easier. What happens is, to your point, you get stronger. You continue to grow through your pain. But I think a lot of times people just have to be encouraged to learn how to grow through that pain, like, like you were saying. Absolutely, because when something like this happens, or even when you lose somebody so close to you, mm -hmm. a lot of times you can't, you can't see the other side. Sure. It feels you're in a very hopeless place, mm -hmm. very hopeless place. So when you're talking about the people around you being strong for you right. and having faith, that there's something on the other side. Right. It's a powerful message when, when you're in it. Yeah, it is. I think when we can learn how to grow together through our collective pain, then I think we'd be better. Key word is learning. If you like this video and you want to learn more about me and the movement that we're building, please go to Kennedy24.com. so much. Um, we are packing the house, as you can see. We have about three or four hundred, uh, three hundred people still outside. So security's working as fast as they can. We only have uh, 24 chairs up here by design um, for people who are disabled or elderly and, and can't stand for this time. So please only use those chairs if you fit in those two categories. Um, if you haven't signed up for a local participation in the Kennedy campaign, uh, please do so in the back there. Patrick's waving his hand, and we're waiting for everybody to get involved locally so we can really show how powerful North Carolina will be for this election. Uh, let's see, uh, merchandise for sale, beautiful sweatshirts and hats. Uh, so again, we'll start as soon as we possibly can. As uh, soon as that back area fills up, we're going to expand the room uh, with these partitions. Uh, so we need uh, people to get in the back there and spread out a little bit maybe. And truth is power, yes. Uh, so anyway, thank you all for coming. We have a great show today with uh, Charles Eisenstein. How about... <laughs> Wonderful musicians, David Newman and Mira. And um, the teams here are incredible. We're working as fast as we can to get everybody in. And again, thank you, Asheville, for following the truth, following the next president of the United States, Bobby Kennedy. I'm Rhonda Rohrbacher, the uh, field director for the next president of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I'd like to recognize health freedom activists and um, someone who helped secure this event for us, Maureen McDonald. Yay! And Beth Baldino, the Western North Carolina Regional Coordinator yes! for the Kennedy for President campaign. And now I'd like to introduce Charles Eisenstein. <laughs> Philosopher, writer, thought leader, and senior advisor to Robert F. Kennedy Jr.
so good, so good to be back in Nashville and uh, have the opportunity to see a lot of familiar faces uh, and have the opportunity to introduce Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, I'll give like a little context for this moment uh, of really profound breakdown and transition in our world, in our country, and then on the other side of that, the possibility of a renaissance, a renewal. Uh, we have you know, an economic breakdown uh, that's been in slow motion for many years. We have uh, a breakdown in our stories about ourselves and about our country. We have a breakdown in the story of the American story of life gets better and better with every generation and we're solving our problems. We have a breakdown in the story that other countries, other people in the world hold America in as the beacon of freedom and democracy and peace and justice in the world. And we have a breakdown in the American political system and the way that we see ourselves as a people, the Democrats and the Republicans, um, and, a, and a kind of a confusion as the old political alignments and the entrenched ideologies no longer make sense. And that is the context in which Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has decided to run, not as a Democrat, not as a Republican, but as an independent. And, and you know, my, my support for him, it's not because I agree with him on every issue. It's not because he's got all of the answers. For my whole life, I've been waiting for a politician who would say, you know, I don't really know everything. Uh, healthcare, I'm not really sure what to do about that. Uh, Israel, wow, that's, that's a tough one. Um, the economy, like, I would say if, if someone has all of the ready answers, don't trust them. Because probably, probably they are wedded to one of these frozen ideologies that defines the Democrats and the Republicans. So I would just ask you, as you listen, maybe to hold your own habitual ideologies and beliefs a little lightly, recognizing that we are in a time of transition where many of the old certainties are dissolving. So, yeah, with that, um, I offer you Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. <laughs> special place of kind of consciousness and enlightenment and I love uh, people here and, and, I, and I always love coming here. I came here for many, many years because one of the organizations that I helped run was the French Broad Riverkeeper. I came here a lot to fundraising and to meet people and recruit volunteers and uh, I just always love coming here. And uh, Charles, I think, really fits well into this community. Um, as you know, those of you who know him, I really didn't know Charles. Charles, I met through one of these weird synchronicities that you know brought a lot of the people to my campaign, which is I train hawks and I'm a falconer and I've been training hawks since I was nine years old. And I do, I have a lot of birds and I, um, and I do one of the fundraising, you know, um, mechanisms that we use is we give away auctions a couple of times a year for Children's Health Defense. I did the same thing for Waterkeeper. The spend a day falconing and a, a woman, this was at a lottery, so a woman, people put in 10 bucks to win a 
chance this woman ran it <coughs> from, uh, wanted from New Jersey, and she said, do you mind if I take, bring Charles Eisenstein with me? And I was, I didn't know who he was. And he came and I spent a day with him in the woods and in the meadows, and I was listening to him talk and thinking, who is this guy? So I, <laughs> he's really smart. And then I, a week later, I called him, and we were just, you know, deciding to run at that point. I, a week later, I called him, and I said, would you consider coming to work on the campaign? And, you know, it's one of the, there, there's an extraordinary group, a team of people who are running my campaign. Um, but, and they all get along, and they're all kind of operating at, you know, at a kind of spiritual level. And, but Charles is just such a gift to us, so I'm very, very grateful for his friendship and wisdom. I was, I went to San Francisco three weeks ago. I spent a year in, San, or the better part of a year in San Francisco in 2018 trying the Monsanto case. So I tried, we tried, we tried, we tried three, we had about 2,400 cases, people who had gotten uh, not Hutchins and Foma from Roundup. They're mainly home gardeners. And they, uh, we, the way that you try it with multi-district litigation, you keep trying the cases, usually in front of the same judge, until the defendant comes to the negotiating table. So we tried three cases. Uh, we won $289 million the first one, I think $87 million the second one, and then $2.2 billion on the third. And then Monsanto, Monsanto came to the table and we settled for $13 billion, but I was there or, uh, you know, for the better part of a year trying these cases. And every morning before court, I would go to Union Square uh, to the gym there. And Union Square in, in San Francisco is the equivalent of Fifth Avenue in New York. It's where all of the big, uh, you know, the big iconic American stores like Bloomingdale's, Macy's, Nordstrom's, Gap, Old Navy, Levi are all there. And then uh, the big European brands like Gucci and Prada and De La Valle and uh, Burberry, Ferragamo, all have giant flagship stores there. People come from Asia from all over the world to shop there. It's one of the big attractions in San Francisco. I went back there three weeks ago and every one of those stores is closed. And it's just acre after acre after acre of plywood. And it's like, as if as if Fifth Avenue had no stores left. They were all closed out. And they're closed because of the chaos that's occurring on the streets, because of this giant homeless population. So there's 525,000 homeless in the United States, but half of the unsheltered homeless are in California. And so I, you know, I, I, I was I felt kind of traumatized by this destruction of a city that I love, and I've spent a lot of time in, and that uh, that to me is the most beautiful city in our country. And so I started studying on, you know, reading everything I could about the causes of homelessness and the, the causes, the cures, etc. And my, I came in with a, a series of biases. One, I thought homelessness was pretty much associated with drug addiction, that it was associated with mental illness, that it was associated with extreme poverty, and that also homelessness, uh, uh, homeless people in other parts of the country like New York or, or uh, Detroit who became homeless there would, would probably prefer to migrate to San Francisco so that they wouldn't have to sleep on the grates and snowstorms and the weather's better. And there's a famously uh, welcoming social service system infrastructure in, in San Francisco. And also, I heard from people in San Francisco that, uh, that cities like Dallas, the police in cities like Dallas and Austin, when they found a homeless, per homeless person on the street, instead of bringing them to the local county jail, we put them on a Greyhound with a one-way ticket to San Francisco. Yeah, wow. A lot of people in San Francisco believe that. Oh, oh, 
And my son Connor introduced me to a writer called Matthew Desmond, who's written a book called Evicted. It's a best-selling book, and it's kind of the definitive work on homelessness. And he had a lot of lectures and podcasts, and he's done a tremendous amount of research with the University of San Francisco. And they've actually gone out and given questionnaires and, and uh, inter had interviews with you know, a large part of the homeless population in San Francisco. And what he says, what his studies show, is that the homeless in San Francisco are almost all from San Francisco. They weren't imported. And that um, they were not, uh, they didn't start out mentally ill. A lot of them become mentally ill. Homelessness makes you mentally ill very fast. Within three days, you begin to have this psychic deterioration. Uh, but very few of them actually started out mentally ill. And that there are much higher population, higher concentration of drug addicts in other places, like West Virginia and Detroit, which don't have homelessness problems and poverty in those areas. San Francisco is the richest city in the country. So what Desmond says is that the only variable, um, the only cor real correlation is with housing prices. And California has the highest housing prices. And uh, Los Angeles, where I live, the average price of a home is $800,000. Oh, you have to be earning 250 grand a year to be able to, to afford that home. And what Desmond says is this epidemic that we've seen of homelessness in San Francisco is about to travel across the country like a tsunami and, that, and carry with it the same levels of social deterioration, economic destruction. Uh, and the reason for that is this unprecedented escalation in housing prices. You all know that every, the price of everything is going up from inflation. And inflation, of course, is the result of spending $8 trillion on war over the past 20 years and $16 trillion on COVID. All of which, all, all of which we've done nothing for in return. But, you know, food, child care, health, care all going up, but nothing like housing. Uh, the average price of a house in, America, in the United States two years ago was $215,000. Today is $400,000. And the, the, uh, the interest rates have gone from 3 to 7%. So a, a, you know, a young couple trying to get into a home today will pay four or five times what they were paying two years ago. And why is this happening? Well, the big reason is there's three giant companies, including the biggest company in the world, BlackRock, and then Vanguard and State Street, three of the biggest companies in the world. And those companies all own each other. So it's really one big company. And, um, and they also own, collectively, the three companies own 88% of the S&P 500. So they own business in this country. They own everything. And they've now decided they want to own all the land. So they're buying the agricultural land, and they're also buying the residential housing. They want to turn us into a nation of renters rather than owners. And they already have corporations own now 5% of the single family homes within, uh, if, if we stay on this trajectory, within six years, they'll own between 40 and 60%. And, um, and what does that do to our country? Well, one thing is it makes it impossible for young kids, you know, who are getting out of, uh, who are graduating college or out on the street to ever get into a home. The big, as Charles mentioned, the central promise of the American dream was that if you worked hard, if you played by the rules, you can finance a home, you can have a summer vacation, you can raise a family, you can put something aside a retirement on one job. There's not a single kid walking around today who believes that promise applies to him. I have seven children, and I think my oldest one uh, is 39 and has a home. He's in a home because he missed this. The rest of them aren't even, they all went to good schools. They all have great jobs. Not one of them is thinking of getting into a home. And all of us know kids who are living with their parents who shouldn't be anymore. 
And we all also know stories of somebody who was about to buy a home, put it in on it, you know, go into escrow, sign a contract, and at the last minute, somebody comes in with a cash offer, 20% above asking price, and snatches it off the market. And you find, try to figure out who this is. It turns out to be an LLC with an ambiguous name. And if you follow the breadcrumbs, it will lead you to Black Rock State Street in Vanguard. So, um, and you know, I, my kids, um, you know, are, like I said, they're worried about their college loans. They're not, none of them. When I was that age, me and my friends were at least thinking strategically about how you own a home. And in this generation, they're not. Um, I saw a very, very troubling uh, poll three weeks ago, which said in 2013, a poll of, of young people, young Americans between 18 and 34 years old, found that 85% of them said they were proud of the United States of America. The same poll taken three weeks ago shows that only 17% are. So somehow in the last two presidential administrations, the entire morale of a younger generation has been shattered. Now you have a whole young generation of kids that is utterly disillusioned, that has no hope for their own future, and has lost all the pride in this country because, and it's not because they're apathetic, it's because we let them down, we betrayed them, um, we've given them a world where all the promises that were made to us and made to them have been broken. And what does it look like, you know, if we have a, a nation of renters? If your nation of renters as opposed to buyers, it's being it's the same as going from from being citizens to being subjects. Right. If you own a home, you care about your community. You care about the schools, you care about the hospital, you care about the police, you care about the appearance of your property, you are concerned with your neighbors, you are rooted in that community, but more importantly, you have an entree into the capitalist system because you have equity. So if you have an entrepreneurial impulse, you can you can get a hold of capital. And uh, and even if you wanted to buy something small like a sewing machine or something or, or bet the whole second mortgage on a restaurant or a bar or a retail outlet, you can do that. We had a period of our country called, uh, that I was raised in the height I called the, the economists called the Great Prosperity right after World War II, when America, the American middle class became the greatest economic generator in the history of mankind. When I was a little boy, when I, my uncle was president, America owned half the wealth on the face of the earth. We were the biggest exporter of goods. And it was because it all started after World War II when the GI Bill and a lot of other legislation got an entire generation into homes. Oh, a generation of Americans were now homeowners and they could borrow money and they could pursue their economic impulses and, you know, and cultivate America's industrial genius. And that's not true for this generation. We're going the opposite direction. We're turning back into a feudal model, a colonial model, where this new oligarchy, this corporate kleptocracy will own all of the land and all of the homes and all the businesses. And we become, you know, consumers and renters. And um, I'm running against two presidents who both are running on the platform that they brought extraordinary <laughs> prosperity to our country. <laughs> and, but yeah, uh, when, when I travel around this country, I'm not finding people uh, echoing that. I find them saying that's we're being gaslit. And I, you know, I, I spent six months talking to people all over this country, but, but in all the, the 40 years before that, I spent sitting at people's kitchen tables because I'm representing them on lawsuits and litigation. Today, I'm representing a thousand families in Columbiana County, Ohio, in East Palestine, whose lives were upended by the Norfolk Southern spill. Um, Until recently, I represented 10,000 people in, in Spelter, West Virginia, who were poisoned by a zinc smelter. And I'm also representing uh, 10,000 families up on 
the Ohio West Virginia border who were poisoned by DuPonts, but by PFOAs and PFAS from DuPont. And I, I have cases like that all over the country, so I spend a lot of time sitting at people's kitchen tables. And what I'm hearing about is a disintegration, not only economically, but also uh, culturally. Like our, our communities are disintegrating. Our public health has never been worse. The chronic disease epidemic, which has overtaken the middle class in this country, um, and, uh, and the, the mental health epidemic of suicide, of alcoholism, addiction, depression, which we've never seen anything like this before. And the, the average wage in our country is now $5,000 less than the cost of basic human needs. Of food, transportation, and housing. And not the good food. You know, not, not uh, whole foods. But the food that you get at the regular grocery store, which is very low in nutrition and very high in, you know, Pesticides, actually, uh, neonated toys, all of these, you know, really uh, are things that are contributing to the, the epidemic. If that's what you buy, if that's, you know, the, the basic needs to keep you alive, your $5,000, the average American, is now $5,000 in debt at the end of the year. How are they paying that debt? They're putting it on credit card. So, Two weeks ago, we hit a new milestone in our country, a trillion dollars in credit card debt, private credit card debt, a trillion dollars. And, uh, and the oil companies, Visa, MasterCard, Wells Fargo, uh, Chase, Citibank, and Morgan, are charging 22% interest on those cards. If, you were, if you're the mafia, the mafia did that, they would be, and they would go to prison, it would be called loan sharking, they'd go to jail. But those companies, it's just business as usual. Who do you think owns every one of those companies? Uh, BlackRock. Oh, um, so yeah, they're doing it right in front of us. They're, you know, they're, they, they're just, they're strip mining the wealth, the equity from the American middle class and our democracy at the same time. During COVID, you know, and I'm, I run into people who are making these terrible choices now. Elderly people who are cutting up their prescription pills to make the prescription last for a week. Mothers who are changing to cheaper ingredients to make it through the, you know, the grocery line. A kid a couple weeks ago told me every Tuesday I choose between having a meal and filling up my car with gasoline. People choosing, you know, uh, between a, a young couple who told me about sitting in their living room with the baby crying on their lap in a, in a rental apartment they can no longer afford because the consolidation of housing is now driving up rents. Um, and, and listening to the baby cry and having to wonder whether that baby is $50 sick or $100 sick or $1,500 sick before they bring them to a hospital. Those kind of arguments shouldn't be taking place here. 57% uh, of Americans cannot put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency. And if you are in that group, which is more than half the people in this country, and the engine light comes on in your car, it's the apocalypse. Because yeah. you can see the future. You can watch your life circling the drain. You know you can't pay that mechanic. Your car's going to die. You're not going to be able to get work. You're going to lose your job, and you're going to end up on the sidewalk, just like all those people in San Francisco who were not mentally ill, they were not drug addicts. They just had the engine light come on. And they're out there. <laughs> you remember during COVID, they locked down, they shut down 3.3 million businesses. And uh, with no scientific citation, no due process. And they, but they kept uh, Amazon open. And and I, I'm suing Elizabeth Warren and Amazon now because Warren asked <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Warren, who I've known for many, many years, asked Amazon to censor my book on the lockdowns. I, this isn't the Fauci book, it's another book that I wrote with Joe Mercola. And uh, so Amazon was censoring 
the Amazon got to close down all of its competitors. Yeah. And then it was censoring people who were criticizing that policy while it was breaking in billions. And we all got a, like a two and a half year lesson in how to learn Amazon, how to use Amazon. I didn't know how to use Amazon prior to COVID. And um, I, and, and by the way, it's magical. You, know, it's you, you just find a picture of something you want and you, you put send and it's in your driveway the next day. And of course that's very seductive, right? But you know, there's a cost to that convenience. Like there always is a cost to convenience. And the cost is that the local retailers are now gone. 41% of black owned businesses will never be open. And so that was the guy, and I'm sure you all know somebody who closed down and didn't reopen. That was the guy who was paying the local taxes here in this community. That was the guy who was employing our children, you know, during summer vacation, who was who had a plaque on his wall from the local Boy Scout troops thanking him for his for supporting him. Who was for me that you know it was the local retailers and you know in my town who were paying for my kids' uh, hockey jerseys and their and their uh, their little league uniforms. And those people are all gone now. That money was recirculating in our community again and again and again and building us all. Uh, and now, you know, it's all going to, um, to Amazon. And, but at least Amazon pays local taxes here, right? No, they don't. But at least they pay federal taxes. No. Last year, zero. So, they're, they're, like I said, they're doing it right in front of us. And who do you think the biggest owner of Amazon is? Uh, BlackRock. So oh, um, I, you know, I was, uh, I saw President Biden when he came back from Vietnam, he went to Hawaii and he did a, the first day there, he did a 9-11 memorial. And he said in uh, his speech, something that surprised me, he said that Osama bin Laden bombed 9-11 because they, they hated us for our freedoms. Oh, it surprised me to hear him say that because that's what George Bush said back then. And all the Democrats ridiculed him for it. And I went on Neil Cavuto the next day and I said, you know, that's just not true. That's propaganda. It's just not true. I don't know why he would say that. Well, what is the motivation to say something that is not, that is patently not true? Osama bin Laden said again and again why he bombed the World Trade Center. Because we took, put two military bases next to Mecca. And he said before that he loved the United States because we had supported him and fought side by side with him in the Afghan war and helped expel the Russians from Afghanistan. Oh, he had no problem with our country till we put military bases in his home country and next to, you know, Mecca, the most sacred city for his faith. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, they, it's not because they hated for his freedom. I went to Poland with my dad. When I was a kid, everybody wanted, we were the biggest export of goods in the world. Everybody wanted American made products. When I went to travel abroad, straight with my dad and my mom or alone, my people would come up to me, strangers, and, and offer to buy my blue jeans. People wanted American transistor radios, they wanted American RCA controllers, television sets, which we invented, we're the only manufacturer at that time. Our, our automobiles, which were the gold standard automobile in the world, everybody wanted them. I went to Poland in 1964 with my dad, my mom, and three of my siblings. At the time, Poland was a communist country. They did not want us there. My father went at the invitation of a local democracy, democratic advocate. And uh, the, the Polish government was so irritated that we were there, that they blacked out any news of our presence in all the state on media, which is all the media, was the only media in Poland at the time. In fact, the day before we went to Poland, my mom brought us uh, shopping in Washington, D.C. to buy gifts for kids in an orphanage in, Poland, in Warsaw. And when we showed up at the orphanage, we were very excited about giving them these, you know, American clothes and toys. When we showed up in, at the orphanage, the 
Polish government had re removed all the children because they didn't want any contact between America, you know, between us and the people of Poland. And two days later, we went to Krakow to visit the Cardinal and the Cathedral of the Black Madonna. That Cardinal was a living saint. He had stood up to the communists, he had been jailed, he had been tortured, his, the, the piety and dignity with which he endured that suffering had inspired a giant religious revival in the Catholic Church in Poland. But everybody knew that when he died, he'd be beatified as a saint. And for us little Catholic kids who every night, every single night when I was growing up, we read the lives of the saints, a chapter from the lives of the saints. And uh, um, for us, it was the, the biggest thrill of our lives that we were going to meet an actual living saint. And so we went up through Krakow, through the uh, Krakow Square, which is one of the biggest squares in Europe. It looks like a mile long. We were that it was dead empty. The only thing in it was the embassy limousine, but that we came in. And about three and a half hours later, we came out of the cathedral. There were a million people in this square. And the word of our presence had spread by mouth. And the, the, the stores had closed down, the whole city had closed down, and everybody had emptied out to come see my dad. My uncle had been killed the year before. And um, when we came out, that, that limo was trapped in a sea of humanity. And we ended up staying there for about two and a half hours. My father pulled us all through the rear window of the car up onto the roof, and then he gave a speech. And in English, I have no idea what they understood it, but they went crazy. <laughs> and, then, and then they started singing to us, so what, which means may you live forever. And then they sang, they sang. <laughs> and they started singing a, a, an anthem that we were told was illegal at that time. It was an anti-communist uh, anthem. And they, uh, it was a criminal act to sing it in Poland at that time, and they sang it again and again and again for two hours while we stood on there. And I was a little kid, 11 years old, signing autographs for the first time in my life and watching this crowd with tears flowing down people's faces with these expressions of joy on their face and reaching up, all of them just reaching out to try to touch one of us or to touch my dad. On that same trip, I went to Greece, Italy, France, Germany, England, and everywhere we went, we found those crowds were there. And they didn't hate us for our freedoms. They loved us for our freedoms. They started hating us when we betrayed our freedoms, when we betrayed our values. And became a, a nation of, uh, of war. My, my, you know, one of the reasons that people were so happy with our country at that point was because my uncle, who had died the year before, had made a strategic choice that, um, to keep the country out of war. And he told his best, one of his two best friends, Ben Bradley, who ran the Washington Post at that time, asked him one day, what do you want as your epithet on your gravestone? And he said, he, he kept the peace. He said, the, the principal job of an American president is to keep the country out of war. He said. <laughs> he said, he didn't want little kids in Africa and Asia and Latin America when they heard of the United States of America to be thinking of a man with a gun. They wanted him to be thinking of a Peace Corps volunteer, of the Kennedy Milk Program, which gave nutrition to millions of malnourished kids around the world, of the USAID and the Alliance for Progress, which my uncle created to put America on the side of the poor, to end run the oligarchs and the juntas, and, uh, and help build middle classes around the world. Um, to, in order to sustain and nurture democracy. Three days before my uncle took office, Dwight and I was at his inauguration, and um, on my birthday, January 17th, 1961, Dwight Eisenhower, the outgoing president, 
gave what today I, I, I would look back and say is probably the most important speech in American history, where he warned America against the emergence of a military industrial complex, which would transform our exemplary democracy into a, an imperium abroad, and then a surveillance state, a uh, security state, a garrison state at home. My uncle shared those, those, those worries. And, you know, four months into his presidency, um, the CIA and the three top officials of the CIA lied to him and the members of, of his Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military brass, lied to him boldly to his face about the Bay of Pigs invasion. And when those men were dying on the beach, which is the worst part, the lowest part of his presidency, he took the blame publicly for what had happened. But privately, he said to his staff, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it. Next few months, he fired uh, Charles B B uh, Bissell, who was the chief military officer of the agency. He fought, I mean, Richard Bissell, Charles Cabell, uh, and uh, and he fired Alan Dulles, who was the you know the uh, director of the agency from its birth. Um, and Dulles then later mysteriously showed up on the on the running the Warren Commission. But uh, my um, my uncle spent the last uh, the next thousand days of his presidency in a pitched battle to keep the country out of war with his military advisors. And uh, he kept us out of Laos. He was called a traitor for that, for the Pentagon. He kept us out of Cuba in 61 and 62, and again was called a traitor. Uh, he kept us out of Berlin in, uh, in 62 at the Checkpoint Charlie crisis. And he kept us out of Vietnam. His, his, his top advisors, the people he really loved, the people he trusted and really loved, Max Taylor, General Maxwell Taylor, um, Bob McNamara, uh, Avril Harriman, and Dean Acheson all told him, you have to send 250,000 troops to Vietnam or the government's going to collapse. And he said, um, it's their fight, it's their government, we can't make it an American war. He ended up sending 16,000 advisors who, which incidentally was fewer troops than he sent to get to Oxford, Mississippi to get one black man, James Meredith, into Old Miss. Uh, but um, they weren't allowed to fight under the rules of engagement that he ordered. They could advise, and teach, but uh, some of them did anyway. And he found out on October 22, 1962, at a Green Beret had died in Vietnam, and he asked Walt Ross now, or a casualty list. Paul Ross now came back and there were 75 Americans who had died at that point. And he said, that's too many. I'm bringing them all home. And that afternoon, he, he signed National Security Order 263, ordering all military personnel out of Vietnam by 1965, with the first thousand coming home the, the, the next month in December, the month after he, or a month and a half after he signed that 30 days after he signed that uh, that order, he was murdered. And a week later, President Johnson signed, uh, a, a re a remanded that order, and then sent 250,000 troops to Vietnam, and it became an American war. And, um, and then Nixon came in after him and sent 560,000. We killed a million uh, Vietnamese, we at least, well, 56,000 of our troops never came home, including my cousin, George Skakel, who died in the Tet Offensive. And, um, and since then, you know, and, and my father ran against that war in 68, won the Democratic primaries, and then was gunned down that night, 91. And Martin Luther King, who had become a peace activist two months before, was assassinated. And these traumas, my uncle's murder, my... Uh, my father's murder, Martin Luther King's murder, the Vietnam War, 9-11, and COVID, each one of those national traumas pushed our nation a little farther down that road that Eisenhower warned us against, of, you know, becoming a...
reality right now where I think everybody here has the feeling that it's not really a democracy anymore. It's like a Hollywood set, you know, it's a kabuki theater of, uh, it has these little things like we go, the ritual of voting and everything that tells us that we're living in a democracy. But how many people be here really believe that, you know, that anybody in government is actually listening or cares about anything you say? It's very, very few people. So, um, and now, you know, we're, we're, we're in a new, we, over the past, over the past 20 years, we spent $8 trillion on wars. My uncle wanted to project economic power abroad, not military power, which is what the Chinese are doing and eating our lunch all over the world. We spent $8 trillion bombing ports, schools, bridges, roads. They spent $8 trillion building those things, and now they're beloved in the world and we're despised. It hasn't, hasn't made us safer. It hasn't won us more friends. And, uh, and here's what we got for $8 trillion. With the Iraq war, which was half of that, Iraq's now worse off than uh, it was when we found it. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. We killed between 650,000 and a million. We pushed Iraq. Iraq today is an incoherent, it's not even a nation, it's just an incoherent battle between Shia and Sunni death squads. We pushed Iraq into a uh, proxy posture with Iran, which is exactly the foreign policy outcome we tried to avoid. We created ISIS, and in that war with Syria, we tro drove two million uh, uh, Syrians up into Europe and destabilized every democracy in Europe for the next twenty two for the next two generations. Brexit is a direct outcome of that of that you know forced migration, as is the riot, our riots that are occurring today in France. So that's what we got for eight trillion. Now, in March, we committed another one hundred and thirteen billion to Ukraine for a war that was a war of choice that, that we could have ended twice. The Ukrainians wanted to end twice. The Russians, you know, made very, very generous peace offers and then signed them. And uh, that would have left Ukraine intact and, and, uh, and given, uh, you know, very good offers. And we torpedoed them both times, people in the White House and State Department. Oh, it was, a, a, and we're sending, a, we committed $113 billion. And now, the same month, and now, last week, we, we committed Congress, both House of Congress, the Democrats and Republicans, who are getting their money, are all getting money from Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing and Lockheed, and there, there's no anti-war party anymore. It's just one war unit party. They all voted to, to send another $24 billion to Ukraine, so that's about $140 billion. Um, and when with the month that we committed 113 billion was March of 2022, the same month we cut food stamps for 30 million Americans from 283 dollars a month to 23 dollars a month. We cut Medicare for 15 million Americans completely. So, and that that same month, the Fed printed 300 billion dollars unanticipated twice what we're giving Ukraine to bail out the Silicon Valley Bank. So when the bankers need it, and when the military industrial complex contractors need it, if the door, the door of the safe is wide open, they just come in and take whatever you need. And but when the American, when Americans are brothers and sisters who are hungry, who are sick, who are needy, who are broken, when they need it, there's nothing there. The door is slammed shut. And um, Mitch McConnell was asked that month, but by the way, the entire budget for EPA is $12 billion. So that's all we have for the environment in this country. We're giving 12 times that to Ukraine in one year. And that's just the beginning because even if the Ukraine war ended today, we're still going to spend a half a trillion there rebuilding the country. The contracts to rebuild it are even bigger than the war contracts. So Mitch McConnell was asked in, in March, because the Republicans are supposed to be concerned about budget deficits, and he said, can we really afford $113 billion? He was asked. He said, don't worry, it's not really going to Ukraine. It's going to U.S. military contractors, so it's good for our country. <laughs> oh, he just admitted. 
exactly what we've all been saying, that it's all just a money laundering scheme. A Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, and Lockheed. Who do you think owns every one of those companies? <laughs> and then I saw Tim Scott on the Republican debate. Republicans were all trying to outdo each other, except for Vivek, to his credit. About, about, um, about who was going to spend more on these wars, on Ukraine, and then, and then they said, we're going to go to war against Mexico, and then we're going to get China. So they've got a whole you know, pipeline of, of um, you know, finances not ready for those companies. And Tim Scott pipes in and he says, he says, don't worry about the budget deficit because this isn't really a gift, it's a loan. So, how many think, how many here, raise your hand if you think that loan is going to get paid back? <laughs> yeah, nobody. Nobody in the country thinks that loan is going to be paid back. But why do they even call it a loan? Well, they call it a loan because if you call it a loan, you can impose loan conditions. So what are those loan conditions? Well, one it is extreme. Uh, austerity program that makes sure that anybody who's poor in Ukraine will never get anything. Uh, more importantly, the loan agreement requires Ukraine to put all of its assets up for sale to international corporations. So its roads, its bridges, its airports, etc. But most importantly, its land. Ukraine has the, the richest agricultural land in the world. It's the breadbasket of Europe. There's a joke that if you throw a boot on the ground in Ukraine, that it will, something will grow that you can eat. And, uh, and there's been a thousand years of wars for control of that land. Every corporation in the world wants to get their hands on that asset. It is, it, it control the food supply for the world. And, you know, we've had now 400,000 Ukrainian kids who have died to protect that land. And uh, the loan agreement, which I think the Ukrainians probably don't know, the kids who died out there don't know this, uh, the loan agreement requires Ukraine to sell all that land on an international, what they created, a land market. And 30% of it has already been sold. The companies that have bought it are three companies, DuPont, Cargill, and uh, Monsanto. Oh, great. Who do you think owns every one of those companies? Right. Oh, like I said, they're doing it right in front of us. And one other thing, the big money is going to be for a contract to rebuild Ukraine. In December, the winner of that contract was announced. Who do you think it was? BlackRock. Oh, and the head of BlackRock, Larry Fink, went over and, you know, ironed out the details in a private meeting with Zelensky. Larry Fink is also on the board of the World Economic Forum. And he's part of the, what they call the Billionaire's Boys Club that meets in Davos once a year to organize, you know, the world for humanity. And their reorganization, they call it the Great Reset, and when the head of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, was asked to summarize the meaning of the Great Reset in one line, he said, you will own nothing, but you will be happy. So they're responsible for the first part of that. And then I guess we're responsible for the happiness part. But they're, they're going to own everything. So like I said, they're doing it right in front of us. But, and how are they getting away with it? Here's how. They're, they're keeping us all at each other's throats. Black against white, Republican against Democrat, using these culture war issues. They're, it's like the jangling keys over here while they're robbing the bank over here. Everybody look at this and don't watch what we're doing. You look at that Republican debate. It was all culture war issues. Nobody mentioned BlackRock. Nobody mentioned what's happening to land prices, to property prices. 
what's happening to this generation of kids. Nobody gave us any solution. It was all, you know, be tough on women, be tough on gays, be tough on trans, be tough on Mexico, be tough on China, be tough on Ukraine. And, you know, and, and they're all important issues. Uh, but it misses the big point of what's really happening in this country. And, you know, when the king and queen look over the balustrades of their castles and all of their subjects are fighting each other, they go back to the banquet table and they pop champagne corks because they know nobody's coming over the castle wall. And, you know, what my objective is with this campaign over the next 13 months and, you know, during my presidency, Focus on the values that we all have in common, which are much bigger, <laughs> much, much larger than the issues of this all apart. And then uh, to lead everybody over that castle wall and take back our country. <laughs> central issue of all of this is this corrupt merger of state and corporate power that is taking place in the public agencies yeah. have turned these agencies into predators against the American people. And I've spent my 40 years suing those agencies. I've sued almost every one of them. I've sued, <laughs> I've sued, I've sued DOT, I'm, and I'm doing that now. I've, I've sued USDA and the Department of Agriculture, which was created to help small fam family farmers and to give us, to make sure that we had a wholesome food supply and its function is actually to do exactly the opposite of that. And, uh, and then I've sued EPA, FDA, CDC, uh, NIH. Just won a big case in the Court of Appeals against the FCC for her, you know, for cell phone radiation. The safety of cell phone radiation. Oh, I when you sue an agency, you get a uh, a PhD in corporate capture and how to unravel it. And I understand that perverse incentive systems in these agencies that put corporate capture on steroids. I know the individuals. Their names of many of the people in these agencies who are chiefly responsible for the corruption. And I feel like I'm, you know, that I, I'm excited about having this job and actually going into those agencies one at a time and, uh, and cleaning them up and, and returning them to serve. <laughs> in my announcement speech that if you give me some ground and a, if you give me a sword and some ground to stand on I will win this country back for our nation and I'll tell you what I need from you and those of you who want to help is that you know, go to Kennedy24.com if you can send any money do it, five bucks, if you can't do that volunteer, we have 220,000 volunteers now. We have more, 10 times more than any other campaign. But we need them. I need, I need to go out over the next months and get a million signatures in, in each state, and we need a big, big volunteer army to do that. And uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, there's a lot a lot of people in this country who should be voting for me and supporting me, but they're not. Because they have an idea about me that is largely inaccurate. That are ideas that are promoted on CNN, M CNN MSNBC, the New York Times, etc. If, if I lived in a bubble where those are the only things I looked at, I'd have a very low opinion of myself. <laughs> um, 
about what we found and, and were told again and again and again. That those people convert very quickly if they can actually see me speak, answer questions, engage in conversations. And what people say is they, if they, they have a relative or, you know, who's just, you know, dead set against me with all of these ideas, and they can get them to watch to a few minutes of the Rogan podcast or Tucker or Jordan Peterson or all of them or any of those. Well, there's a very, very high and very quick conversion rate. So uh, how do you do that? You, raise, you wear a Kennedy button, you wear a Kennedy hat, a T-shirt, you put up a lawn sign and, uh, you know, put on a bumper sticker. And when people ask you, people will come up and ask you. Most of the people who do that get good receptions, by the way. They're not people throwing eggs at your house, generally speaking. <laughs> uh, but... When everybody reports, people come up to them and say, why are you, you know, supporting them? And if you can direct them to that podcast, like I say, we have a high conversion rate, and that's what we need to do. We have a lot, we have a good period of time, 13 months to do it, so. And my numbers are already enough that should guarantee me a place in the debates. <laughs> now. I, I speak there in about, I think, two and a half hours. But I, um, and so, you know, we, what I try to do with these things is try to take a selfie with everybody. <laughs> now, we had a crowd this size, 600 people in Charleston, because this seems insurmountable, but we had a, a crowd this size in Charleston about three weeks ago, and we, 600 people, we did in 24 minutes. We have a method. Um, if people cooperate. So, anyways, any of those of you who want to say and take a picture, I'm going to do that right now. Uh, uh, thank you all, and God bless you. And, and uh, I, you know, I will see you the next time that I come to Hatchville. So. Selfies, they're going to be performing a very special song called Stay Strong. And please get your cameras out and your phones ready, and um, no, no autographs today. Puppies. 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 Pupp
spirit of heaven right here today. Stay strong, keep your faith alive. Raise your hands, raise your hands. Up here, stay strong, keep your faith alive. This is the Danger Close Podcast, Beyond the Books, with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is 2024 U.S. Independent Presidential Candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We cover a lot of ground here, including ground that I have not heard him cover anywhere else. And now... Without further ado, Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Thank you so much for taking this time. I know how busy you are since we last talked. You announced your candidacy as an independent, and uh, and here we are back, and it's, a, it's such an honor for me to be able to talk to you today. So thank you so much for taking the time. The, uh, the honor is mine. I'm a huge fan of yours, Jack, and I'm Happy for every opportunity to talk to you. So this is, you know, uh, this will be fun. Yeah, I feel the same way. And uh, for those who didn't hear our previous podcast on yours, um, on your podcast, we met uh, in August of uh, late July, August, early August of 2017, uh, Megan Townsend's wedding to Billy Birdzell, a Marine buddy of mine uh, out in Hyannisport. Hey, Megan Townsend, which nobody will know, is my niece, my sister's. Uh, eldest daughter, and she married a, uh, a compatriot of, of, of Jack's, who had, I think he fought in Iraq with you. That's right. We were in Najaf, the battle for Najaf at the same time, but we met afterward, even though we were there at the same time. Uh, and then we ended up doing uh, some operations in Mali, of all places. And Billy Birdsell, and they lived right down the road from me, and uh, we're very close, but Jack was one of the, the uh, ushers in his wedding. So I got to meet you for the first time in 2017 at Cape Cod. Yep. Yeah. The Kennedy compound. And, um, you know, I've been part of your admiration society ever since. Oh, well, thank you. I sincerely appreciate that. And, uh, and I got to escort, uh, your, your mom the next day to the christening and then to breakfast. And then I got to sit with her and, 
it inspired my latest novel, Only the Dead. And for people who have read it, um, they'll know the character that uh, that your your mom inspired. Um, but that came from that time, from summer of 2017, that uh, that that part of the the last novel. So uh, I'm indebted in more ways than one because it was the the uh, the best novel to date. I haven't made it to that one yet. I might have to wait till the end of the campaign because I've got a lot of. <laughs> Uh, uh, mandatory reading that I got to do, but I, I'm looking forward to that. You are, yeah, you're a little busy. And um, so I want to make sure that I get to campaign priorities because I have nine pages of notes and I know we're not going to, we might, we might scratch the surface. So I want to start with your priorities uh, in the campaign to make sure that we hit those. Um, but right before I do that, just because it was in the, the news this morning, um, and I have this right here from your, uh, uh, your website and it's a request for, to Secretary Mayorkas for Secret Service uh, support, protection. Uh, and I think it was just a few few days ago where another person um, broke onto your rear property. Um, and this comes uh, about a month after someone identified themselves as a U.S. Marshal trying to get in the back door of an event, demanding to see you armed with two handguns. Um, why do you think that uh, those requests thus far anyway, at the time of this recording, uh, have been denied when there's a, a history and a very, it's a very interesting history because it shows uh, compassion on both sides of the aisle to afford secret service protection to people who are uh, uh, adversaries and have been attacking one another essentially in, in the press for months on end. And that secret service protection up to this point has been afforded. And it's a, it's a very rich history, I think. Um, and in this case, it has been turned down multiple times. What's what's going on there? The, well, let me tell you what happened yesterday. My, my wife was, uh, who, you know, you know, is uh, actress Cheryl Hines, um, was in her office and she was doing a Facebook Live. She has a company that, you know, has a, like a uh, health and wellness uh, uh, creams that she that she makes. She was doing a Facebook Live for that, and she saw a guy come over the fence, and uh, and then she saw I have a security team that I pay for now, um, and they uh, they had guns drawn and they were chasing him and and uh, and they apprehended him and and handcuffed him. Um, so, and then he was then the police came, took him into custody, asked me you know, what, whether I wanted a protective order. And I said, yeah, I would like a protective order. This gentleman incidentally has sent me, I think, 449 emails over the last three months, including last week, uh, one that talked about putting a bullet in my brain. You know, that's a quote from him. And, um, and the police took him into custody. And two hours later, he was back at my house again, climbing the fence again. Um, the other guy that you talked about came to my event to have a speech that I did on a, at a theater on Wilshire here in Los Angeles. It was a big Hispanic event. And he asked to be uh, admitted into my green room. Uh, and one of my security team, I, Gavin DeBecker Associates, the kind of premier security team, noticed that his badge, his a U.S. Marshal badge was a little too shiny. He had it on a lanyard, and then he had federal ID, uh, law enforcement ID on his belt. Um, and they uh, they apprehended him. He had two shoulder holsters with uh, with full magazines, eight rounds each. And then he had about, I, I think, five or six extra magazines in his backpack. He had another pistol that was loaded in his backpack and he had knives and other weapons. And then, you know, when the police went into his house, uh, they were filled with uh, rifles and and uh, of various kinds, uh, ARs and, and uh, sniper rifles. And he just before he left to come visit me, he cut a uh, TikTok tape that said, you know, I'm on a mission uh, and, you know, if I don't come back from it and call your commander in chief. Uh, so it had all of the ingredients of, you know, then of somebody who, you know, might pose a genuine menace. Now, we had a, about a two months before that, three months before that, we had requested Secret Service protection and we had provided the Secret Service 
with 68 pages of detail about threats against me. I get death threats, as you might imagine, quite often. And, uh, and you know, they, the, the, see, the rule is, when the rule was, was made, uh, originally the Secret Service was only given to, uh, to nominees, so the, after the convention. But after my dad was killed in 1968, they, all of the, uh, all of the candidates were at that point immediately given Secret Service protection, and then Congress changed the rules so that uh, people are entitled to Secret Service protection 120 days before the general election. They're entitled to it then, uh, but they are. Uh, it, it's pro forma to give it to them earlier. So my uncle Teddy got it before he even announced. I, and I, I'm in the same position as him. He was running against a president of his own party, uh, Jimmy Carter. And Carter gave it to him. You know, Carter was a gentleman and just gave it to him uh, before he even announced. I think he got it uh, 440. Uh, let me, let me, yeah. I actually. 441 days. 441 yeah. days. And then uh, Barack Obama got it 551 days out. Right now, we're, you know, coming up on November. So it's almost exactly one year out. Uh, so it'd be 300, like 375 days. Clinton got it 249 days. Pat Buchanan, 258 days. Pat Robertson, 343 days. Uh, George McGovern, 297. McCain got it 200. Uh, Newt Gingrich, 245. Mitt Romney, 279. Rick Santorum, 254. Ernie Sanders, 279. And Joe Biden, 231. So that's interesting. Oh, they all got it further out than uh, 120. I'm the first uh, presidential candidate in history that has requested Secret Service and then been denied. Uh, when we, you know, got in the back or uh, talked, uh, very, very, and in detail with the Secret Service. The Secret Service was wonderful, and they initially told us this is a no-brainer. We expect that you know we have eight details that are uh, that are ready to go, and uh, we expect this will be approved within ten days, and fourteen days at the most, and we'll probably do the, start interviewing you. 10 days before, because they come and do a preliminary interview to uh, answer your questions about how it works. Are they going to go to the gym with me? Are they going to go out on dates? You know, are they take us on dates? Do we drive ourselves? All of those questions that normally you would you would have, right? Even though I've been around Secret Service a lot of my life, yeah. I don't know how that stuff works. So they come and explain it to you. So um, they... Uh, they said, you'll, you'll hear back from us within 10 days, 14 days at the most, and we didn't hear from them again for 88 days. And I got a letter from Secretary Mayorkas, who's the director of, um, of Department of Homeland Security. And he said, uh, we've made a determination, you don't need Secret Service protection. Now, this, we now have, because we got it from FOIA, from the Freedom of Information Law, the Secret Service risk assessment that tells me York is he is at elevated risk. So the decision was a political decision. Um, and I don't, you know, I can't tell you what their rationale was. Uh, I assume that what they, uh, that, uh, there, there was probably two ingredients that one, they, it kind of gives a legitimacy to my campaign that they don't want to give to it. You know, it, you know it, and the other is they understand I need I need to have protection, so my campaign is going to have to pay for it, and that's going to cost me millions. It's already cost me over a million dollars, and um, and they would rather me be spending that million dollars on security than spending it on field organization, etc. So I, this again, Jack, is just speculation. I don't know. I can't look into their heads. I can tell you this, that I, I am, you know, I, I'm not, I don't worry about my personal safety, as I'm sure you don't worry, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about that, because that's just not the way my mind works. I do worry about my family, and particularly their sense of well-being. You know, I want my wife to feel safe in her home, and I want, you know, her daughter to feel stay, safe in my home. And, um, 
And then the other thing is there, there, you know, if there was an incident, like if this guy who came fully loaded, people don't go, he, you know, he's later claimed this guy who, was, who visited me in, in, uh, at the theater, he later claimed he was coming for a job interview, but you don't bring, you know, you don't bring extra clips. Not, extra the only thing. Not if you want the job. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but and so I worry that if if somebody like that, if there was an incident and somebody was taking pot shops at me, somebody in you know a bystander may be injured, and exactly. it, it's it's a danger to everybody. It's a danger to the public. Um, and so, you know, but uh, the bigger worry I actually have, the most troubling part is that um, we've seen this weaponization, the politicization of the. Uh, of the law, federal law enforcement agencies across the board. Yeah. And you know what I'm talking about. My father, when he got, when he became attorney general, his first weekend, he summons the entire upper staff of the, all the directors, all the branches of the attorney general's office. And he said, um, the number one rule in this office is that there's not going to be any politicization of the Justice Department, which is always a temptation you know, for presidents to pro pro prosecute or persecute or prosecute yeah. their uh, political enemies, you know, people who to, to look into, you know, did they violate antitrust? Did they violate IRS laws? Is there something else that I can do to hurt this person who is a political rival? My father ended up prosecuting his own brother-in-law for under antitrust law because he, had, he, he bought a, a sports team, what is now the Atlanta Braves. And um, and he prosecuted him for it. And, they, you know, and the people in that department knew a lot of his political allies got prosecuted. People he liked are prosecuted under him because he said there's no politicization. And that is that is critical for a democracy that the public has faith that the law enforcement agencies are administering the law uh, with neutrality, with, you know, justice is supposed to be blind and prosecution is supposed to be blind as well. So we've seen this, you know, President Biden is uh, providing protection to his his family, uh, to Hunter Biden, to you know other members of his family uh, that cost millions and millions of dollars. And he uh, he's providing it to Anthony Fauci um, at a, a million dollars a month, uh, to John Bolton, to many people who haven't even been in government for many years are all getting Secret Service protection. And it, I think the optics are bad for a democracy. You know, we're supposed to be the world's exemplary democracy. I think the optics are bad if if the president is giving protection to his friends, his families, his political allies, and denying it to his political uh, rivals. President Biden has a bust of my father right behind him in the Oval Office. and. Um, you know, that amplifies the irony a little bit. But, but I'll, I'll say one other thing. I'm involved with a number of lawsuits against the federal government for uh, for censorship, including one lawsuit uh, called Kennedy versus Biden that's now in front of the Supreme Court. And it's a companion case of Missouri versus Biden. And we've gotten a lot of documents in the discovery process in that case. And what we found is that uh, and Judge Doty, who's a federal district judge, who's, whose uh, decision has now been upheld, he wrote a 155-page decision, and he ordered the, the White House to stop, uh, to cease all contacts with social media platforms. And but what his decision uh, chronicles is this uh, this campaign by the Biden administration that began with me. 37 hours after President Biden took the oath of office, swearing to uphold the Constitution, his White House staff was uh, was engaged in email exchanges with the top executives of Twitter, telling them to take down my uh, my you know my uh, postings, telling them to take down my site, and you know two weeks later, they. Uh, Instagram took down, you know, my site with, at that point, I had 800,000 followers. And what the documents we've now recovered from the discovery process and the documents that Elon Musk has uh, really heroically released, which are called the Twitter files, show that the 
the agent that White had and White under White House pressure, the FBI was granted a portal directly into the social media sites so that they could reach into those sites and censor posts uh, that the White House didn't like. And that access, the FBI provided access to that portal, to the CIA, to DHS, to the IRS, and to a, about a dozen other federal agencies who were all in there, you know, uh, uh, removing posts or altering posts or slow walking them, what they call shadow banning them, posts that they didn't like. And so you had the, the federal government directly involved with censorship. You had all of these federal enforcement agencies that have now been politicized to support, you know, President Biden's reelection efforts and to support his policy goals. And they weren't just, you know, uh, censoring me for public health. And by the way, I do want to say this. I probably have the best fact-checking operation in, in North America today. So uh, we have 350 PhD scientists and MD physicians on our advisory board, and they help make sure that everything I post is because everything's questioned. So I'm not going to post something that is, you know, crazy. Everything I post is cited in source to peer reviewed publications or to government databases. So it's true as far as you can, you know, if, as far as you can discern whether, you know, there's an existential truth. This is as true as it gets. But Facebook had to invent another term, which is called, which they called malinformation, because they were saying, oh, the things these people are saying are actually true. And so they got the, the White House and Facebook developed a new term, coined a new term called malinformation, which is not misinformation means it's factually erroneous. Malinformation means it's factually correct, but it is still inconvenient to the government. And, um, and that under that basis, they were removing my uh, my posts, and and so they they were, but they also removed posts about people criticizing the Ukraine war. Um, people who were uh, in one in one this is in Judge Doty's decision. In one case, it was uh, somebody who did a satire of President Biden and and Joe Biden, uh, his wife. So these were just things that were politically, uh, you know, distasteful to the White House, and and the way they were, they were strong arming the social media sites to go along with this is they were threatening them with revoking their Section Two Hundred and Thirty immunity. Now, for your, you know, listeners who don't know what Section Two Hundred and Thirty is, Section Two Hundred and Thirty is the is the Communications Act. Um, uh, regulation that says that uh, social media sites are cannot be sued for defamation or things that other people post on them. So they're kind of a common carrier, and you know that that is carrying. They're not responsible. It's a common carrier. has got a lot of people on the bus, and they're not responsible for you know what those people do and say. And so, like, if I publish something in the New York Times, if I, let's say I publish an op-ed uh, in the New York Times that accuses you of some heinous crime, you know, of sex trafficking, right, um, or something like that, and you want to sue, you can sue me and you can sue the New York Times, and they're responsible. But... And so anytime, like I published for many years op-eds in the New York Times, and every one of them was vetted by an attorney. So everybody knew that if Facebook had to vet every post with an attorney, Facebook, it would be existential for them. They'd be out of business. Mm -hmm. And so they granted them, Congress granted them Section 230 immunity so that they are not responsible and they don't have to vet it. Well, the White House was now saying to them, we are going to yank your 230 immunity. And uh, and that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg said that's existential for us. Our business is over. Our, you know, Facebook shuts down the next day because mm. otherwise we're going to get 20 million lawsuits. We get a billion posts a day. You know, 20 of those are going to be act. 20 million of those at least are going to be actual every day. And the, the company couldn't survive. Yeah. So that was the uh, the hammer 
at, uh, that the White House was using to make them censor my um, my pros. And it, it's just part of this landscape now where we're seeing the wholesale uh, politicization and, and weaponization of these federal agencies. And I think my denial of Secret Service protection is, is you know, part of that genre. Yeah, no, I agree. And it, it goes on along to continuing continuing to degrade trust, whatever trust is left in these uh, federal agencies. It just plays right into that. And and uh, it, I mean, it hurts the country. And I, I think it shows also that they're afraid of you. Um, they are balancing. Well, what if this guy is killed on the as in, in the lead up here? And we have all this history of both parties affording Secret Service protection to these candidates much farther out than you are right now uh, without the support that you have right now in, in with polling data. And so they're weighing that against how much money because they know you have to spend it. Uh, and for people that are listening, this kind of protection is extremely expensive. Uh, so they, they know that. But how horrible is that that they are weighing those two things, your life, not just your life, like you mentioned, and not just your families, but other people at campaign events, anyone in the general vicinity of where you make an appearance. They're risking all that for this political end of you having to spend money there and not on your campaign to get the word out. I mean, it is, history is good. definitely going to look back, I think, anyway, well, it depends on <laughs> this. The other things you talked about with social media I and plan, controlling plan that information. Ugh, it's uh, I, I, it's I, not a good History's going to say they were playing hardball. Uh, but it's, it, but, I guess they're just counting on everyone being distracted by 15 second TikTok videos and not looking into the pages of this history, which I think is a remarkable history of both parties providing affording protection for the candidates who are in opposition uh, to them. It's a anyway, it's 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 horrible. But um, the logical conclusion is that they want you to spend money, take it a few steps further. And they're afraid of you and they're not as concerned about you not being on the campaign trail much longer if that anyway we'll move on from that it's 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 awful um and before i get to these campaign policies and i, I encourage everybody to go to your website and you know, there's videos on there that talk about your priorities it's so so well done um but your decision to run as an independent since last time we talked you made that announcement um what uh what went into that and how has it been how has that been received by by both sides i you know but i people were uh clamoring for me to do this and it just became at one point you know i didn't want to jack i i didn't want to leave the democratic party my five my family has been that you know party you know welcomed us when when my family my all my great grandparents came over during the potato famine in 1848 you know coming from a country that had uh and had suppressed the rights of uh, Irish couldn't vote, couldn't hold political office. Um, I had an ancestor who was the priest was was hanged for teaching them how to read and write, which was illegal. Um, they weren't allowed to own land. They weren't allowed to practice a profession. And they weren't allowed to, uh, uh, under the statutes from, from 1691 onward, they weren't allowed to participate in public life. So when the Irish landed in this country, they took to politics like a starving man takes to water. And uh, everywhere they went, they began, um, you know, dominating the political process. And my my great grandfather, Patrick Kennedy, was a ward chief of the probably the number the senior ward chief of the Democratic Party in Boston. And his contemporary, who was also my great grandfather, was uh, Honey Fitz, John Honey Fitz Fitzgerald. Who was a uh, who was the first ghetto Irish Catholic mayor? There'd been an Irish Catholic mayor kind of been chosen by the Brahmins before that um, to, uh, but he was a pet Irishman. My uncle, my grandfather, was a you know was a ghetto Irish and was part of an insurgency against the Brahmin control of Boston. And then his godson was John Kennedy, who took his seat in Congress uh, and. And became the first Irish Catholic president of the United States. And you know, my uncle Teddy ran for president. Um, my uh, my fam, my father uh, died running for president. 
uh, all of them within the Democratic Party. So, and then I've had, you know, a brother who served, uh, I think, eight terms in Congress. I have a nephew who served six, six terms in Congress. My sister was lieutenant governor of Maryland in the Democratic Party. And, you know, I can go on and on. Many other members of my family, my cousin Patrick Kennedy was uh, in, I think, 10 or 12 terms in Congress. Uh, there's been uh, Kennedys in uh, political office as Democrats and the leadership of the Democratic Party for uh, since the 1920s, uh, for, for a century. Wow. And so for me to leave that party was, uh, you know, um, was uh, was I, I'm not going to say heartbreaking because I'm not really a, a really sentimental person, but it was it was a difficult decision and it was one that I resisted a lot. But once I figured out, once it became clear to me, the party made clear to me that they were not going to allow me to win the nomination, no matter what. They changed the rules. Somebody came, uh, did a, a tally of 60 rules that they changed in order to make it virtually impossible for me to win. I mean, the most obvious one was they made a rule that uh, anybody, any candidate who can pay campaigns in the state of New Hampshire, that none of the votes will count for them in New Hampshire. So, and I already campaigned in New Hampshire. So what it meant was that, you know, the first primary that uh, I could not possibly win and they did the same thing in Iowa, and then they were uh, they did a lot of other things to try to make sure that I couldn't win. And that the problem is the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party's own rules say that they have to be neutral in election. Uh, but everybody knows a lot in twenty sixteen. Um, they uh, they uh, they put their fingers on the scale. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was then the head of the Democratic Party put her fingers on the scale to make sure that Bernie, who who should have won and probably would have beaten Donald Trump, that he could not win. And when her shenanigans got exposed, she was forced to resign. But what happened then, Jack, is that um, some of Bernie's followers sued the DNC in federal court and the federal court judge after you know hearing this story about how they had fixed the election in violation of their own rules would say they have to have been be neutral the federal court said well it doesn't matter what they did it doesn't matter how low they sank no matter what kind of uh uh wagman maneuvers they engage in it's a private club and they can do anything they want they don't have to obey their own rules they can throw you out of the club. They can keep you in. They can not, not nominate you by acclamation of a, mm. you know the, the officers. Anything they do is okay. So my election was the first time where they were like, "Oh, okay." So now there are no rules, and so you know we can come out of the closet. So they merged. I, although there's their rules still say you know they have to be neutral. They merged the the DNC merged its fundraising operations and its strategic operations. Mm with the Biden campaign. They publicly endorsed President Biden, which they're not supposed to do under their own rules. And and it was, for me, it was like showing up at a football game and your opponent is where, or and the referees are wearing your opponent's uniform. Um, they, uh, they, they had all of these super delegates and what they call uh, pleos, these, this class of unelected delegates who the DNC controls, who could control the outcome of the Democratic Convention. And what it really became clear is that they would rather have, you know, my numbers, Jack, showed that I, that um, again and again, that President Biden was either tying with President Trump or losing to him, and that I was consistently beating President Trump if I ran within the Democratic Party. By eight points, I would beat DeSantis by 11 points. Why is that? The, the reason for that is the Democrats will vote for anybody other than Trump. A yellow dog they would vote for. Um, and Or a dead person other than, than President Trump. So, they, um, so if I ran the Democratic Party, even though a lot of Democrats have distaste for me because they've been reading the defamations and the propagandas and the pejoratives that are, you know, the, the, the daily flow on MSNBC and CNN and the New York Times, they still would prefer me to President Trump. And then I draw much more heavily from independents and also disaffected Republicans. So if I ran 
as a Democrat, um, I would do much better than President Biden run, but both well against Trump. Um, and, you know, and I would also add that I can actually debate President Trump, and uh, and I don't think that President Biden is going to be able to do that. Yeah, that's. I, I haven't seen him have any kind of unscripted um, uh, encounters with voters or anybody else, and I, even the scripted ones have not, you know, gone well. So I think. But I think for the party, because the party is really now responding not to the Democratic rank and file, but they're responding to their donors. And their donors are BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street, which own, you know, 88 percent of the S&P 500. They're McDonnell Douglas and Raytheon and Boeing and Lockheed and all your friends, you know, <laughs> who, you, know you know what they're up to. You know, they want this constant pipeline of new wars. I was going to ask you about that. I have that in my uh, my list of things to discuss. Uh, and I know I was I said I was going to get to those policies. But, but since you brought up family history, I did want to ask about um, your memories of your family's relationship with the special operations community. People people that are watching and listening to this might might know, but some some might not that um, that your uncle authorized the wearing of the Green Beret for Army Special Forces and was uh, president when the first two SEAL teams were commissioned. Yeah, my my father. Um, and my uncle I have this tremendous admiration. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. It, it was beyond admiration. They really, you know, they were people who really put um, physical courage and moral courage. You know, my my uncle famously said that um, that courage is the most important virtue because all the other virtues rely on it. First, and first wrote, edition of yeah, first edition right there. Inaugural won, edition, Profiles and Courage. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Profiles and Courage, but um, they loved uh, war heroes. You know, my, my uncle was the only president in history to, um, to win the Purple Heart, um, and his brother died during the war, died a hero, um, and, you know, volunteered for essentially a suicide mission and was killed on that mission. It was the, actually, it was the first... Um, remote control planes. So they they were making an aerial bomb out of an airplane, and they loaded it with bombs. And they were going to the the plan was that my uncle would take it off because they didn't have the they didn't have that you know they they couldn't do that kind of remote control. So he was going to take it off, get it at altitude, and a companion plane next to him would turn on a remote control, begin steering it, and they were going to steer it into the submarine pens off of uh, Scandinavia, the, the uh, German submarine pens, and blow them up. And But as soon as he turned on, and my uncle was on his way home. He had, had completed his last mission, the mandatory, you know, I think it was 52 missions at that time as a, as a pilot. And he was on his way home, and they asked for volunteers to volunteer for this. Um, and he he was a great hope for my my family. You know, he he was a guy who had who had every gift from God. He was you know an athlete. He was incredibly good looking, incredibly brilliant. And you know, my grandfather really hoped that he would be the first Irish Catholic president, and put all of his hopes into my uncle Joe. And uh, Joe volunteered for this mission and was, uh, as soon as they turned on the remote control, it detonated all the bombs and you know, um, and, and he was vaporized. Um, and my grandfather, 30 years later, if you mention his name, would, would cry. And uh, so um, my uncle and father, my father had, had enlisted in the war. In fact, tomorrow I'm going down to San Diego to launch the, you know, a new uh, a cruiser at the Navy is launching that's named the Robert F. Kennedy. Wow. There's a, there's a battleship that's named after my uncle who died, um, uh, Lieutenant Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., um, and my father, during the war, he he enlisted in '44 when he was when the day that he turned 18, the day that he was legally allowed to enlist. And he and he, but he was on that uh, that battleship for the last year and 18 months of the of the uh, World War II. So all of the brothers had been to the war. 
they all had this tremendous admiration. My father's Justice Department was loaded with his friends from Harvard who were all former Marines um, and who had fought at Guadalcanal. They had fought at Iwo Jima. And he just admired that. And my uncle, when he came into office also, was looking for ways to avoid nuclear war and, um, and to do more unconventional warfare and particularly to sort of meld the, the Peace Corps with the, uh, with the military, to have people who could go in and not just kill people, but could dig wells and could, um, could make life better for, you know, the, for peasantry in countries where, uh, where, they, are, where they might otherwise be seduced by, by communists. And so the, the Green Berets at that time um, had been ordered to the the Pentagon did not like the Green Berets and they there was a hostility toward them and they and they ordered them to give up their berets and my uncle uh, issued an executive order saying that they could wear the, the berets and he became very very close and all of us did to um, Major Ruddy who was at that time the you know the top. Uh, commander of the Green Berets, and I went many, many times to Fort Bragg when I was a kid. I went to the Jungle Training Center and El Yunque and in, uh, in Puerto Rico where they were training and watched them train there. Uh, they came to our home when we were kids. We had a, a four-story house, and they would fire grappling hooks up onto the top uh, and climb up the uh, the wall of the, you know, the, up the brick wall of our house and um, and uh, and then rappel down. And you know, I went on the zip lines at Fort Bragg when I was a little boy. And and the, but the Green Berets were very very close. And and my uncle, when my father made sure that when my uncle was killed, that it was uh, that there was a Green Beret was included in the pallbearers who carried his calf elk and and Major Ruddy uh, left his beret on the. On uh, on my uncle's grave, you know, my father actually went back at midnight that night with Jackie, and the only thing they found on the grave at that night, you know, after everybody had cleared out, they wanted to be alone with Uncle Jack, and they found Major Ruddy's uh, green beret on there. And after that, for many years, I don't know if it's still true, but there was a black stash, a little black black ribbon that was affixed to the green beret as a memory. To my uncle, and as you pointed out, um, my uncle uh, launched the SEALs. So the first two SEAL teams were, you know, one of the things that were a project that was very dear to his heart because he wanted a special forces group that was attached to the Navy. And, uh, and so he launched the first two SEAL teams, and, you know, that was the beginning of the Navy SEALs. Incredible. Did, uh, and, and I might have conflated these two stories, and I forget where I where I heard them. But the the grappling hook uh, climbing around the house, and then the zip line story. Did they put? Did they come to the house and put in a zip line in Hannesburg? Uh, they put in a they put in a zip line at our house. <laughs> I, I think I heard yeah. it was fairly treacherous, or it got treacherous over the years. Yeah, it did. There was a lot of emergency room business. <laughs> it was up there for. 20 years and the way that it worked is you had to have somebody it had a trail rope on it so that and then it went into the trees into pine trees at the beginning at the end at the end of our, our, our home we had a six acre home and it was up on a hill but it, at the bottom it was ringed by a fence line of of uh, spruce which are you know they're nice pine trees and then there's spruce and spruce there's no way that you can get into a spruce tree without you know getting a lot of uh, Pine needles in your face. In fact, Muhammad Ali went on that zip line, and he got uh, during one of the pet shows, and he ended up. They had a little special Olympics kid who was a huge admirer of his, and yeah, he it wasn't little. He was a big kid. He had Down syndrome, and they asked him to catch the rope, and he saw Muhammad Ali coming to him, and he just was disarmed by the, by admiration and just watched him go by into the trees and he got a face full of nettles and um which he didn't like he was very uh protective of his face <laughs> and um 
and then George Bush went on it when he was vice president, you know, and he had, as you probably remember, I think when he was 80 years old, he jumped out of an airplane. He had been, you know, he had, and I don't know whether he was a pilot or a paratrooper during the pilot. World War II, but he was also a war hero. Yeah, pilot. Um, but he went on it. You know, it was it was scary. There was a, the, <laughs> the Green Berets built an airplane up in the tree. They, they built a tree house, but it was in the shape of an airplane. Nice. And so you uh, you got the experience of jumping out of a plane onto the zip line. And uh, and as I said, when we had the my mother had a pet show there every year and people with there was a line to ride the zip line and there was always uh ambulance at the bottom of it and you know back then people didn't sue each other so they, they just drove them to georgetown emergency room but uh and there were a lot of emergency room runs from that <laughs> nobody would do that today nobody would do it today <laughs> that's right liability <laughs> uh oh my gosh they also they also built a uh, an obstacle course in our in one of the past years and it was a really uh, you know it was a it was a green beret uh great obstacle course yeah. and it had you know climbing walls on it and it had rope uh, lines and, and it had um uh, uh, uh and it had water hazards and all of this other stuff so amazing. uh amazing yeah they were a big part of our lives growing up that's incredible there's i want to ask you about the um American University speech uh, piece um, and as it pertains to your campaign. But before I do, since we're on special operations, there's another speech that uh, that your uncle gave at West Point where he talks about wars of the future and insurgencies, um, assassins. And it's a, it's a remarkable speech. I post a portion of it every uh, uh, January 1st when the first two SEAL teams were commissioned. So I do post that every year on my on my Instagram and uh, and on Twitter. But um, since we're on the topic, uh, history, it's November of 1963, such a pivotal point in our nation's history. We discussed it on your podcast a little bit. So much changed on uh, November 22nd. And I think that really was an awakening. It's where the trust in government um, really began to deteriorate. And the actions of the government since that day uh, in relation to that event have done nothing to help rebuild that trust. In fact, it's done the absolute opposite of that uh, to include up to this very day and uh, uh, the last two administrations who have essentially violated federal law by not releasing the documents related to those investigations. Um, and both, both parties, two different presidents, and if they were not complicit in the events of November 1963, they're going way out of their way to make it look like they are. Um, <laughs> yeah. And well, that, yeah, and that's been the, the issue. And you know, it, this is a, this is a longer discussion, and, and I'm happy to have it. But you know, one of the issues that came out of my uncle's death, and there were many, I think it it was a fork in the road for our country. But it, one of the forks was, as you just pointed out, the credibility of the government when my uncle was president 80 percent of the the people in our country said that they trusted the government and that they believed the government wouldn't lie oh that's a huge change and and that really started changing jack in in may of 1960 right before my uncle's election i, I think at that point 100 percent of americans would say the government never lies it's our government we own it it's not going to lie to us, um, and and that was when Gary Powers U two was shut down. The U two program was a CIA program. Nobody knew Americans didn't even know that U two existed, and they, you know it was it was flying at I think over a hundred thousand feet. It was flying very very high, maybe seventy five hundred thousand feet, and taking pictures. And they, they, it was invisible to the naked eye, and they thought it was impossible to shoot down. But the, because there was a mole in Langley, they had figured out, the Russians had figured out a way to shoot it down, and they shot one down. Pilots were under order to use a, um, a, a coin that had a needle in it, and, and uh, a, a, that was a suicide injection. I think it was filled with... Uh, 
arsenic or uh, you know something cyanide that was super something. lethal. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you Cy- think? Cyanide or something? Yes, I think it's cyanide. That's right. Oh, and and so Dulles and Eisenhower at that point was planning a summit with Khrushchev to talk about perestroika, talk about you know um, about peace between the two nations. And he was very excited about it. He was, you know, he wanted to end the war, the Cold War. And Dull, and then we should, then this this jet gets shot down. And Alan Dulles, who was running that program, that program was run out of the Atasui Air Force Base in in Japan, and it was a top secret. It was a CIA base. And um, Alan Dulles told him they they can never prove that we have this. Uh, this airplane and the pilot was under orders even if he survived he would have killed himself so they'll never be able to prove it well the Russians had Gary Powers he did not use the sign he chose not to and so they let us they let Eisenhower go on TV and lie about it and say we never did it he told the world that he told the American people Russia's lying and then the next day they produced Gary Francis Powers. And that was the first time Americans said, holy cow, our government is lying to us. And then, you know, with 1963, it just made sense. I, you know, when my uncle was killed, I was, well, you know, my uncle was killed, right? And then my father, the first three calls he makes are saying, are the two of them to the CIA, one to John McCone, who's the director of the CIA. When I came home that day from school, my mother picked us up early, brought us home from school. The flags were already all at half staff. And my um, and my father was walking in the yard with, with John McCone. And, he, and in that conversation, we now know, he said to John McCone, did your people do this? John McCone, the CIA was only half a mile from my house, and we used to ride through it on horseback every morning. My father would take us at six o'clock uh, riding every day and before breakfast and before school. And we and then John McCone, when my father and uncle fired Alan Dulles after Bay of Pigs, they brought in this guy who was a straight arrow. He was a you know pious Catholic, he, and he was, and they thought and he was a Republican. They thought that he would straighten out the CIA, which of course you know nobody even he was he was non compass mentis. He didn't even know what they were doing, and nobody told him so. He didn't know what was happening. And my father then called Harry Ruiz, who was a, a, one of the Cuban refugees. And that's who my father suspected would be, the, you know, wanted to kill my uncle very badly. And he said to him the same thing. He said, did your guys do this? And then he called a dentist sergeant. But um, the uh, my, my um, I mean, that was kind of the, the first instinct that he had and then i was uh three days later i was in the white house in the east room i'm now uh, you know a 10 year old kid and um and president johnson come down with you know standing next to my uncle's cask with just the family members and president johnson comes in and he says that Lee Harvey Oswald was just killed by a man named Jack Ruby. He told this to my father and Jackie and my mother, who are all standing right next to me. I turned to my mother and I said, why would he kill, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald? Did he love our family? Right? Because it made no sense to me as a 10-year-old kid. And it made no sense to anybody in our country. And of course, he didn't love our family. He was a mobster who ran prostitutes for the Carlos Marcello mob, which was, you know, one of the, the three mobs, along with Santa Traficante and Sam Giancana, who had had their casinos in Havana taken away from, from Castro, and were working with the CIA on the assassination program. But this guy was, um, you know, was not a friend of our families, and, and, uh, and it made no sense to the American public or anybody else. Why would he walk into a police station in broad daylight and risk his life to, to kill this guy? And then he's, you know, he had all these, these terrible associations with men that my father had prosecuted. Um, that, that day, 
my father was the jury was was out on Carlos Marcella's case, who was his boss, Jack Ruby's boss. So, um, so no, it made no sense to everybody. And whether you believed it or not, or said you believed it or not, there was a large part of the American public who said something is wrong, and the government's not telling us the truth. And then you know. Every year they're supposed to release these documents, and every year they don't. And and I don't I don't know what they told Biden because Trump. What did they tell Donald Trump? Donald Trump was no friend of the CIA's. Yeah. Why does Why does he promises again and again in his campaign? I'm going to obey the law. The, assass- the JFK Assassination Documents Act required that they all be released. I think by 20, 2017. 16. Yeah. 2017. So, so he says, yeah, I'm going to release them all. He goes in there saying that, and then he gets in there and he pivots and never explains why. He, you know, he said things privately, I've heard, but, you know, of course you don't know. Um, but, you know, he said kind of suggestive things to people that if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't want to release anyways. I've heard people say that. I don't know whether he said that. I don't know what his explanation is. If I ever... If I ever am in a room with him again, and I have been in rooms with him many times before, I sued him twice, and you know he was very friendly to me when I, during that period I was suing him to keep him from building golf courses in the New York City watershed, and I won. But he was very friendly, and then he asked me to run a vaccine safety commission for him, and I spent the day with him and his kids and Steve Bannon and all of his you know cronies up in Trump Tower, but. That was before this. But if I ever get alone with him in a room again, I'm going to say, you know, why did you change your mind? Because yeah. it's not like him. You know, he doesn't care about breaking things. And he doesn't yeah. care about embarrassing the agency. Yeah. But, uh, That's why it's so odd. Look, let me tell you one, uh, just one other thing, which, which is the other part of, the, you know, the, the turning point. Mm-hmm. President, as you know, President Eisenhower, three days before my uncle took the oath of office. And I was there at that time. You know, I was uh, sitting on that bleachers in the freezing cold that day, the glistening blue sky and, and snow all over the ground. Three days early on my birthday, January 17, 1961, President Eisenhower gives his farewell address, which you know and I know now is, is arguably and probably the most important speech in American history where he warns America against the emergence of military industrial complex that will turn our nation into an imperium abroad and to a national security state, a surveillance state, a garrison state at home, and will destroy American democracy, will gut the American middle class. And he goes through all of these horror stories of what's going to happen to us if we allow this to continue. I want to wish veteran Wally King a very happy 100th birthday. And want to thank everyone from that greatest generation, the World War II generation, who fought and sacrificed so much for the freedoms that we enjoy today. At Navy Federal Credit Union, every day is Veterans Day. That's why they're proud to have served the military community for over 90 years. Their employees are part of the community they serve. Many of them are veterans themselves. They serve more than 2 million veterans, so they understand the needs of veterans. They provide resources like Best Careers After Service to help veterans transition to civilian life. They're a top VA home loan lender. They offer award-winning 24-7 stateside member service. Use the hashtag gratitude mission to thank a veteran and honor their service. Your service inspires ours. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash veterans. Insured by NCUA Equal Housing Lender. Hey everybody, I'm Andy Stumpf, host of the Ironclad Original Change Agents. For over a decade, Ironclad has worked with brands and individuals to create world-class films, series, podcasts, and ad campaigns. In fact, I've been working with Ironclad for the past few years. I was introduced to them on a project through the Navy SEAL Foundation. I've worked with them uh, on a variety of projects, even up here in Montana, long before they proposed the idea of change agents to me. They're the best in their field. And I say that because there are plenty of people out there looking 
for the best, looking for the cream of the crop, looking for the top of the triangle. And if you're looking for that, you need to look no further than Ironclad. If you ever need media by way of film, a series, podcasts, or ad campaigns, they have you covered. You can reach out today and follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad, the ampersand, and then This Is Ironclad, or visit them online, thisisironclad.com. Again, www.thisisironclad.com. My uncle comes into office determined not to um, allow that to happen. He had his own reasons. You know, he, Eisenhower had said, it will not be a warrior who starts the next world war. It will not be a soldier. It will be somebody who has never been a soldier. Uh, and so my uncle comes in, you know, who doesn't trust the brass anyway, because he's got the you know, the irreverence toward the bad brass that all the kind of lower officers who were actually frontline people, you know, it, it, he called them the salad brass. The guys with oh, yeah. all the, you know, all the, salad, the decorations yeah. on them. Yeah. So uh, he says, he told his aide, he told his best friend, Ben Bradley, who was then, two, he had two, two best friends, Ben Bradley and Len Billings, and he told Ben Bradley, who was then the editor of the Washington Post, he said, Brent Bradley asked him, what do you want as your epithet on your gravestone? And my uncle said to him, he kept the peace without skipping a beat. He said, the primary job of the president of the United States is to keep the country out of war. He said, I don't want children in Africa when they hear the United States of America to think of a man with a gun. I want them to think of a Peace Corps volunteer. I want them to think of the Kennedy Milk Program that provides nutrition and mal you know, millions of malnourished kids. I want them to think of USAID and, and Alliance for Progress would put America on the side of the poor. And that, they don't do that anymore, by the way. They're now CIA fronts. But back then, you know, they, the idea was to grow a middle class and to end run the oligarchs and the juntas and, and actually you know, foster democracy abroad, which we, we said we were doing. And so then, uh, and then the Bay of Pigs happens. He was lied to, to his face by Alan Dulles, Charles Cabell, the military director of the CIA, and, and Richard Bissell, and by some of the his, um, his joint chiefs. They lied to him about about what was you know what was going to happen because he he was very skeptical. He didn't want to allow those men to go in there. He refused to give them military aid to go in there, and he did, thought the whole idea was bad. And said, you know, Castro's got two hundred thousand troops. You're sending twenty two hundred men. What's that? And the CIA said, don't worry, it's all wired. They're gonna, there's going to be an uprising as soon as they land on the beach. We have the whole thing you know set. There, it's all planned. Everybody knows. Astro was going to be overthrown. And my my uncle doubted it, but he was four months into office. They said, if you keep these men here, they're all armed, they're trained, they're dangerous, and it will be a disaster to keep in the country. So we let them go. They're all dying on the beach, and now they come and say, you got to send air cover. And he says, I'm not going to do it. I told you I wasn't going to do it. And it was the lowest moment of his presidency. And he publicly took the blame for it, but privately, he told his aide famously, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. The next thousand days of his presidency are pitch battle with his military industrial complex to keep the country out of war. He kept us out of Laos. Um, they called him a traitor at the Pentagon. He kept us out of Cuba in 61 and 62. They called him a traitor for that. Um, he kept us out of Berlin in 62 during the Checkpoint Charlie crisis. And then uh, Vietnam, they, you know, his closest aides, the guys he really liked, like Max Taylor, General Maxwell Taylor, uh, um, Dean Acheson, people he trusted, Bob McNamara, um, Avril Harriman, all told him, you got to send 250,000 troops to Vietnam or the government is going to collapse. He said, it's our government. He also, in the first days of his presidency, he got a visit from General Douglas MacArthur. And he said to MacArthur, what do you think about sending troops to Vietnam and, and Laos? MacArthur knew more about fighting Asians than any American in history. 
And he said, any president who sends ground troops to Asia should have their head examined. And my uncle would often repeat that to these, you know, to the brass when they came to him. They said, he'd say, don't go convince Doug MacArthur and then come back to me. Because MacArthur, everybody knew MacArthur knew more about what, what would happen to the troops if you sent them to Asia. And of course, he was right. Wow. So my uncle finally sent 16,000 advisors. And he said, it's their government. No, uh, they have to defend it. It's their fight. They have to fight it. We can give them assistance like the French did for us during the revolution, but we can't fight the war for them. So he, so he, he ends up sending 16,000 troops, which is fewer federal troops than he sent to Oxford, Mississippi in 62 to get one black man, you know, James Meredith, into Ole Miss. Wow. So it wasn't a lot of people. And they, under the rules of engagement that he set down, they weren't allowed to participate in combat. They were Green Berets, so of course, they did it, right? <laughs> so October 22nd, he finds out that Green Beret gets killed, got killed. And he went to Walt Ross and he said, give me the casualty list. I want to see everybody who's died. They came back and he said, 75 um, have died. And he said, that's too many. I'm bringing them all home. That afternoon, he signs National Security Order 263, ordering all military personnel out of Vietnam by December 65, with the first thousand coming home December 63, so five weeks later. 30 days after he signs that order, he's murdered. And a week later, President Johnson remands the order. And, you know, President Johnson sends 250,000 troops over. And Nixon, his successor, then sends, you know, 560,000, uh, we kill a million of them at least. Uh, 56,000 of our kids never come home, including my cousin, George Skakel, who died in the Tet Offensive. And, um, and these traumas, and then my father runs against the war in 68, you know, and as soon as he gets, uh, you know, he, he wins the California primary in that night, he's, he, he's killed. Two months earlier, Martin Luther King, who was, by then was a peace activist, that was his big issue then, he's murdered. So these traumas, my uncle's assassination, my father's assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination, the Vietnam War itself, 9-11, and uh, COVID, those traumas, each one of them pushed us a little farther down that road, which Eisenhower warned us against which is, you know, where we are today, which is a, a military imperium addicted to endless wars abroad and a garrison state, a surveillance state at home that has, you know, it has, we still have the, the sort of some of the indicia of democracy, but it's a Hollywood stage. There's no American who actually thinks that their voices are audible in Washington, D.C., you know, and we all know it's rigged. And it's just a kabuki theater of democracy. So we continue to tell ourselves that we have democracy in this country, but you know, it's all being run by, you know, you know who it was, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, and all of their, you know, their minions like Raytheon and General Dynamics and, and uh, Lockheed Martin and, and Boeing and all those guys. To say nothing of the of media. Uh, corporations that yeah, they, they own and those tentacles and the, the connections there. But I think but why is General Dynamics advertising on Good Morning America? <laughs> I mean, do you think that audience is buying killer drums? For, you know, <laughs> they, uh, you know, why are these military contractors and why do you see their advertisements on, you know, popular TV? Because they're controlling content. You know, it's not, they're not actually selling their stuff. They're controlling content. Uh, pharmaceutical industries. There's so many connections yeah. there and uh, similarities between uh, military lobbyists and corporations and the pharmaceutical industry, as you've spoken uh, about many times. Yeah, you know, I, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but if you read Eisenhower's speech, which everybody should do, and it's yeah, a very short speech. In, in its entirety. Most people just know the military industrial complex part, yeah. but the whole thing, people need to watch yeah, it or he, read it. He lays out the, the, he lays out the, the federal scientific technocracy, which is going to obliterate science and is going to, you know, turn us into a, into a, you know, a totalitarian, you know, utopia. 
I don't think a lot of people know this, and you know more about it than anyone, but following the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's my understanding that, I wouldn't say a friendship, but a relationship developed between your uncle and, and, uh, and people in, on the other side there in, in, in Moscow and the Kremlin, Soviet Union at the time. Um, and some of the CIA operations, maybe most of them, focused on Cuba out of, I think, Miami, um, other places in Florida, South Florida, uh, were essentially shut down. And I don't think a lot of people know that part of the history. Yeah, so what happened is um, during uh, in 62, it was interesting because the CIA knew almost nothing about um, about the Kremlin. And that's because there was a mole in Langley. And every time they got a, that they turned a Kremlin official, he was immediately murdered or disappeared. And they sent a lot of people, they sent literally, you know, James Jesus Angleton sent thousands of spies into, you know, they bring people over here, they train them, and then they send them back and parachute them in or whatever. They were all immediately met and murdered. And uh, and so the CIA had no eyes in the Kremlin and didn't know what was happening there. They didn't know anything about Khrushchev. And it was just a monolith to them. And they the way they talk about it to Jack is it was just, it was monolithic. They all wanted one thing, world expansion, world conquest, and he just didn't buy it. Mm. And he knew that all politics is local and everybody is responding to all of these different fissures and, you know, and uh, and, uh, and complexities and competitions. And politics is the same everywhere. And he, he was curious about Khrushchev. And during the Checkpoint Charlie crisis, he... Um, you know, Lucius Clay, who was a, they, at this point, the Soviets were, were erecting a wall because everybody from East Germany, which was now under Russian control, were running to get into West Germany and it was being depopulated. So they were just hemorrhaging people because nobody wanted to be under communist rule. So Khrushchev erected a wall and that was the Berlin Wall to keep these people from flowing out. And Lucius Clay, who was, you know, one of the joint the joint chiefs, a very interesting World War II hero. But they were always trying those, the, the brass was always trying to arrange a provocation to uh, for a nuclear confrontation. They they thought nuclear war was inevitable and that it was desirable that it be as soon as possible because the Russians were catching us and we had the edge on the technology. And they, they kept saying to Jack, if we do it now, we can kill 130 million of them and they'll only get 30 million of us. And my uncle's like, that's wow. That's not, none of that is good. <laughs> so, so Lucius Clay was trying to arrange one of those provocations. So he put a bulldozer plows on the front of, uh, of Sherman tanks. And then they started plowing down the wall. And the Russian... Uh, tank. I don't know what it would be, a brigade or a you know division. But anyway, they confronted them at Checkpoint Charlie, which was the crossing. And there was a standoff that was one of the most dangerous standoffs of the Cold War, wow. um, where there was really no way out. And at that point, my uncle began communicating with Castro and made a deal with him. I mean, with Khrushchev. And Khrushchev said, sent him a, 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 a note that said, my back is to the wall. I have no place to retreat. And at that point, my uncle had met Khrushchev at Vienna in his, the very beginning of his presidency. And he, my uncle came with very grandiose ideas about ending the Cold War and you know figuring out how do we compete economically with each other and, and stop the military competition, which is destroying the world. And Khrushchev met him with all this bombast and this pugnacious lecturing about U.S. imperialism. And my uncle went home from that meeting just in despair. And but now Khrushchev comes back and um, and says he says to him that something vulnerable. He acknowledges to him that he also he's in the same position Jack is, which is they're both anti-war. Khrushchev had been at Stalingrad. Uh, St Stalin was trying to purge him, and he literally hid at Stalingrad 
which was the worst place in the world to hide. It was the worst battle of the of World War II, the, the most horrific, you know, people eating each other and 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 building to building, home to home combat, you know, in in 75 below temperatures with a lot of people freezing to death, a lot of them sorry, it was just horrific. Mm -hmm. And it's where they stopped the Nazis. Yeah. Khrushchev had been the leader there. He had seen the worst horrors of the war, and he did not want another war, no matter what. So, but he was surrounded by an intelligence apparatus and and uh, you know military brass who all wanted to go to war to show their muscles. And then the and they, you know they knew they had won World War Two, right? One out of every seven Russians died. They they you know they. I think they killed a hundred divisions, Nazi divisions uh, that we could have never fought, you know, but they absorbed them and destroyed them. But they destroyed their entire nation. I, you know, I think a third of the nation was leveled. So, and one out of every seven Russians died and they felt like, you know, we, we can do it again if you need us to work. You know, the Russians are tough. And you know the stories from Russia during the war dropping, you know, when they ran out of parachutes, they just flew the planes low and dropped them into the snow, you know, with no parachutes. And if you live, you live. So they were very, they were tough guys. And that, that was their attitude. So that, um, so my uncle, but my uncle, he sent this kind of vulnerable plea to my uncle. I got no place to go. You've got to help me out of this. And my uncle sent him a message. If you withdraw your tanks within 24 hours, we'll withdraw ours. Mm. And he did it. And at that point, they knew they could trust each other. Interesting. And then during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, um, they... Um, my uncle made a deal with him, which was a secret deal. And my father went over and, and brokered the deal with Ambassador Dobrynin in, in the middle of the night, where all of my uncle's staff, there was 13 people on the XCOM committee who, were, who met for 13 days at the, uh, at the White House. My father slept at the White House every night. We were going to be evacuated. To, the, to this underground city down in, you know, the Blue Ridge Mountains. And they came to our house again, me and my brother Joe, and my, we, I was very anxious to go see the place because I, you know, it was this in, incredible underground cavern where, you know, we would weather the apocalypse where the whole U.S. government and their families could fit. So I was anxious to see it. My father called us and said, you can't go because if you don't show up at our Lady of Victory School, the entire nation is going to find out about it and they're going to panic you need to be good soldiers and go to the school and um but he was there for 13 days 11 of the people on the XCOM committee uh, wanted to invade cuba and to take out there were 64 missile emplacements my uncle said to them um said to the cia he said Who's first of all, are they armed? Do they have nuclear warheads? And the CIA wasn't sure. Mm. And he said, Who are the gun crews? Are they Cubans or are they Russians? They said they're probably Russians. How many Russians are there? Over a hundred at each site. If we kill those Russians, isn't that going to make Khrushchev go into Berlin? to West Berlin, and they were like, we don't think he has the guts to do it. And my uncle was like, that is not a good bet. Mm. So he decided to do something else, which was to embargo, to surround Cuba, to not let any, anything in and out. And my father goes in the middle of the night and makes a deal with Ambassador de Brennan. And, and, and by then they knew what, why the Russians had put them in Cuba. They put them in Cuba because we put Jupiter missile systems in Turkey and Italy. And they said, you know, why can you have nukes on our border, you know, 35 minutes from Moscow, and we can't put them on your border, you know, 35 minutes from, from Washington. Right. It's not fair. It's, it's destabilizing. And so um, my uncle made it, my father made a secret deal, and he told uh, Dobrenin, 
if Khrushchev removes them from Cuba within six months, we'll remove them. But if you ever talk about it, the deal's off. If anybody finds out about it, the deal's off. It's just between us. Because they didn't want to look like they capitulated. Right. And uh, Khrushchev went along with it. So at that point, they start, they know they can trust Khrushchev. And Khrushchev starts writing them letters. And the first letter is smuggled in. Because he doesn't want to send it through the diplomatic corps mm. and through his, you know, Kremlin, mm. uh, you know, handlers. He wants to talk directly to my uncle Jack. They install hotlines, one in the White House, one in the House at the Cape. So there was a, a, a phone when we were growing up that was a red phone, and we knew that if we touched it, if we picked that up, Khrushchev would answer it. Wow. And um, and they. The, my uncle started exchanging these letters, ultimately 26 letters, the very personal, personal letters that are extraordinary to read, um, where Khrushchev, you know, says we're all on an ark like Noah's Ark. And, um, you know, uh, and we're all part of a community and we, you know, we can't hurt each other without damaging the ark. Yeah. And, you know, they talk about, my uncle talks about us, you know, you know his, his nephews and, and grandchildren are all playing in the yard there and saying, you know, what right do we have as leaders to, to destroy the lives of these children who will never have a chance to write a poem or participate in politics yeah. or, you know, um, or, you know or, or fulfill any of their own destinies, then they're not at fault. You know, it's a failure of us of leadership if we let war happen. Beautiful, beautiful letters. The first one is smuggled, folded in the New York Times um, to Pierre Salinger by a guy called George Bolshoev, who was a GRU, you know, and you know what the GRU is? The, yeah, uh, okay, is the military intelligence as opposed to the KGB. He was a GRU spy. My father had met him and mother had met him at a reception at the Soviet embassy and they had fallen in love with him. He was a real, he was like the Russian James Bond. He was very charming. He was built like a fire plug, but he came to our house all the time in the State Department. We loved him there because this one, all the James Bond movies were coming out, and, you know, to have a real Soviet spy in your house was just cool. So, um <laughs> And then he would do push-up contests, a very strong Cossack guy, you know, he's doing push-up contests with my dad. He'd do rope climbing contests. Uh, he could do the Cossack dancing, you know, on his haunches. And uh, it was, and so we all loved him. But he was the vector for smuggling all these letters back and forth from each other. Let me tell you about First Form. They have amazing products. My personal favorites are the protein sticks and the micro factor daily nutrient packs. And why do I like them so much? Because first form makes it super easy to get quality protein and nutrients on the go. And I always seem to be on the go while their products are top notch quality. What I like the most about them are their values. First form is so much more than a supplement company. They are deeply committed to both American jobs and your personal well-being. At First Form, they value people. In fact, the only thing they've automated is a tape machine, a symbol of their dedication to providing jobs and making lives better. They care about employing people, nurturing their growth, and genuinely improving lives. Their mission is simple. First Form is there to help you reach your fitness and wellness goals. They believe in a partnership where, if you meet them halfway, they'll help you make progress. Go to firstform.com slash Jack Carr to receive free shipping on any orders over $75. That's one, the number one, S-T-P-H-O-R-M dot com slash Jack Carr. Once again, that's one, the number one, S-T-P-H-O-R-M dot com slash Jack Carr and receive free shipping on any orders over $75. You know, it ended up with Khrushchev and my uncle directly and running their their entire diplomatic corps, their entire military apparatus, their intelligence apparatus, and negotiating the first uh, uh, treaty of the nuclear age, which was the you know the Tasman Treaty of 1963, 
And he gave his, and you know, everybody was against it. Congress was, I think, 90 to one against, nine to 10 against it, and the American public were against it. And he did a whistle stop tour around the country. Um, and he went to the newspapers and he put every energy into that. And he gave this famous speech that you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast at American University where he does something that no American president ever had done, which is he, he said, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the Russians and look at the world from their perspective. And then he talked about the sacrifice and he, he said, we all were are told, you know, from television shows and movies that we ran, we won World War II, we didn't, the Russians won it. And we have to understand the sacrifice they made. Yeah. And it, it, he said to them, imagine if the entire, if every city was leveled from the East Coast to Chicago and all the forests and fields burned. Imagine that. That's what have, That's what the Russians endured to beat Hitler. Yeah. And he said, um, they have a right to have anxiety about their national security, and we have to recognize that right. It's a reasonable right. They're not irrational creatures that, that they're being portrayed. And that speech, this extraordinary speech, completely changed the conversation. And you know, in the end, um, he ended up passing, he ended up uh, uh, ratifying this treaty, getting Congress to ratify this treaty, which was, which ended atmospheric uh, testing of nuclear weapons. Yeah, um, there are a lot of parallels um, to, uh, to that or lessons from Cuban Missile Crisis, removing missiles from Turkey, removing them from Cuba, uh, to what's going on between Russia, Ukraine, and us by proxy. Uh, and I've heard you speak on it uh, with so much more nuance and understanding of the history than I have heard from anyone in the administration, any senior military officer, anyone who has commented on it, uh, uh, elected official side of the house. Um, but there's so many lessons from that time period that would help us as a, uh, as a, as a country yeah. understand. Um, but uh but, 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 before, but before I get to that, I was hoping to get back to that because it has so much to do with what's happening right now. Um, what people also don't know is that, uh, that your father was almost director of the, of the CIA. He was, was talked about. He, I, I wouldn't say he was almost director. Talked about. My talked uncle about. asked him to be director. That's pretty good. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. It was a bad idea because it was when, right after the Cuban Missile Crisis. My uncle fires... Um, Dulles, mm -hmm. who is, you know, the founding director, he fires uh, um, Richard Bissell and he fires Charles Cabell, who is the military director. And incidentally, Charles Cabell's brother is the uh, was the mayor of Dallas. And we now know he was also a CIA agent wow. and he's the one that arranged the uh, the the, um, uh, the route for my uncle's limousine to take. Um, on the day that he died with that dog leg that would, you know, make the limousine slow down, the convertible slow down to a, almost to a stop at, in Dealey Plaza. So um, uh, anyway, he fires the top three guys at the CIA and um, he wanted to get, he understood it was out of control and that it was becoming a government within the government um, and that he needed to get a handle on it. And it, the only one he really trusted to do that was his brother. Uh, we asked Addy to run it. My, my dad said, and my grandfather said, you can't do that because it will be like, you know, if it, it, it will be like Molotov and Stalin who were joined at the hip. And it became an instrument, this secret police. People were worried about secret police agencies then. They thought they were inconsistent with democracy. When the CIA was, you know, after World War II, the CIA, the OSS was disbanded. And it, and Republicans and Democrats said, we can't, we cannot have a secret police agency in a democracy. They, yeah. You know, that they have it, um, you know, they, they have the Stasi in Germany, they have the um, KGB in Russia, they have the Gestapo in, uh, in Germany, they have Savak 
in Iran, and they, these are the things that these are uh, instruments of, of public control that are very, very dangerous, and that you know are inconsistent and antithetical to democracies. You cannot have a secret police agency and a democracy. You have to choose. So people were very mistrustful of it, and uh, but then you know, and Truman very reluctantly started it back up in 1947. Um, but it was supposed to just do espionage at that point. It wasn't supposed, there was no plans division, which is, as you know, it's the kind of the paramilitary functions of the, of the agency. And, um, and that, but, and, and uh, the director, Dulles, created that by, through a, a legislative maneuver, like a late night legislative maneuver, by changing some wording in the charter to allow them to do um, operations. And uh, and then it grew immediately into the, you know, and right after my uncle died, I think a week later, Truman published a uh, an op-ed in the New York Times saying uh, the agency should never have had those powers. I didn't intend it to have those powers, and, and those powers have to be revoked. And my father, right before he died, a week before he died, when he was asked by Pete Hamill, a reporter, what are you going to do about the CIA? He said, I'm going to divide the plans division, the operation division from the espionage division to separate those two, because the problem is when they're working in cahoots with each other, the espionage is important because that's information gathering and information analysis. You're giving the president vital information he needs to, to know to make uh, informed policy decisions, but when it becomes attached to the uh, to the operations division, then they begin to justify each other, and they begin justifying each other's existence, and then covering for each other when there's a mistake and there's no accountability. You know, nobody measures blowback, and as you know, the cost of blowback, you know, in, in every way, it's never measured. You know, yeah. you might you may go in and kill a bad guy in Afghanistan, but what if he has twelve brothers? Exactly. Right? You don't you don't know. You know. Yeah. You don't know what the long term trajectory of that of that of that uh, yeah. operation is. And you know, on a large scale, we overthrew the government of some, of Iran, the first well, the first democracy in Iran's four thousand year history. In 1953, we overthrew Mohammed Mossadegh, who was the most popular guy in the developing world. He was this incredible intellectual, this kind-hearted guy who was giving women's rights, bringing farm, you know, take, uh, bringing, uh, farm reform, agricultural reform, voting reform, education, uh, all these wonderful things to Iran. But, but one of the things he wanted to do was to nationalize BP and Texaco. Fascinating and, uh, history. Churchill tried to overthrow him, and and he threw Churchill out. He threw the British out, and all of his aides told him, "You got to throw um, America out too, because they're going to do it." And he said, "No, America's a democracy. They're just like us. They were used to be a colonial ruled, and they understand us. And they support us. They'll never turn on us." And boy, was he wrong. And Kermit, Dulles Kermit, and Kermit Roosevelt, Kermit Roosevelt there yep. and threw him. <laughs> yep, Kermit Roosevelt. I think he got a uh, a cable telling him to stand down that he uh, conveniently didn't read uh, in time. <laughs> I think there it's a fascinating history right there. And I know we're creeping up on the on the time we have left there. I got through one page of my nine, but uh, <laughs> we have mentioned Alan Dulles a few times in here. So um, this uh, this is my copy the the Warren Commission report right here, uh, which should be called the Dulles commission report yeah exactly and this is the new york times edition right here and it's fascinating because and correct me if i'm wrong i think it was 1979 after the uh committee on on assassinations that looked into um uh not just your uncle's assassination but others as well uh a memo i think went out from the cia to the new york times and other publications uh that talked about the word conspiracy and uh, which, if you look it up, it means a, a, a secret uh, a group. Group and secret are in that definition. So more than one person um, and, uh, and, and secret. Uh, and they said to label people that go against the narrative, which 
that committee on assassinations found that there was the probability of a conspiracy. Uh, and it, it, it's right there after they saw much, a lot more documents than, than the Warren Commission did. Um, and so I find it interesting that the New York Times edition right here, and then you have this memo from the CIA going to the New York Times uh, that essentially says anyone who doesn't believe what's in this uh, needs to be labeled a conspiracy theorist. And they didn't come up with that term, but they certainly popularized it uh, at the time. And it's become, you know, popular is probably not the right word, but uh, it's been, it's been part of the lexicon ever since. Um, yeah. So, so the, uh, just your thoughts before we get out of here on the, uh, on the, the Dulles commission. Um, uh, or how well, yeah. I mean, well, you know, the, 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 the charter of the CIA and there was an act called the Smith bond act. And makes it illegal for the CIA to propagandize Americans. So, and then we found out, you know, when the H House Select Assassinations Committee, which was 79, so the Warren Commission was in 64. Warren Commission was run by Alan Dulles. And we now know that he was meeting every day with who with Hoover, or and he was meeting with a guy called George Johannides, who had been uh Lee Harvey Oswald handler in the CIA. So the, the official liaison to the Warren Commission from the CIA was a guy who nobody knew was a handler of Lee. Lee Harvey Oswald was a CIA asset. Lee Harvey, almost, Lee Harvey Oswald had been a, a Marine. He was a radar operator at the Atasui Air Force Base, which is doing the U-2 flights for the CIA. And um, the, the supposition that he then defected to the Soviet Union in a very, very high profile defection. The supposition is that he was ordered to do that by James Jesus Angleton, who was the counter uh, insurgent or, you know, uh, counter, yeah, counter uh, insurgency, um, uh, counter espionage yeah. director at Langley. And the, the, the supposition is that he, that Angleton was trying to identify who the mole was in Langley. And they thought of a high level, and they knew that the U-2 flight had been given up by a mole. So they knew they could have, the Soviets had could have never shot it down if it wasn't for a mole. So they wanted to, to expose the mole. So they arranged, this is like, again, the, the you know informed speculation that that is why um, Lee Harvey Oswald defected the Soviet Union because they thought they had a trigger system on the file or on Harvey's, uh, on Oswald's file at Langley, and that they thought that people in Moscow would tell them all, go look and see who this guy is, see if we can trust him, see what the CIA does about him, and that they had a trigger system that would tell them if anybody looked at that file. And that individual would be the mole. And of course, after Two years, you know, he, he, Oswald marries the daughter of the uh, of a KGB colonel and then works in a chart factory there. And after two years, he walks into the embassy in Moscow and says, I've changed my mind. I want to go back to the United States. And they give him $600 for an airplane ticket, give him his passport back, which he had, you know, revoked. And they fly him to Dallas where he's met by another guy, a CIA asset called George de Marshall, who then arranges uh, for his family and, and arranges for him to get a, a job at the book depository from, you know, uh, where, he, where later on um, he is uh, uh, linked to the Kennedy assassination. So um, no, nobody knew that on the Warren Commission at that time. A lot of this information started coming out 15 years later when the House Select Assassination Committee convenes and they start looking into it. And the House Select Assassination Committee concludes, and you can read this in the, in the, in the congressional record, and my uncle was killed by a conspiracy. Almost everybody on that, on the staff believed it was the CIA who had killed him. The only exception was the head of the staff, the chief counsel, uh, whose name is Bob Blakely, who I know very well, who's a friend of mine. And Bob Blakely believed it was the mafia, or most likely. And they didn't know the mafia and uh, and the CIA were now kind of one seamless organization because of the Castro assassination projects. 
And uh, but Blakey has since changed his mind because we've since learned that, you know, of, of all the involvement of all these CIA officers in the Warren Commission cover up and in the cover up at the to the state assassination committee. So Blakey now believes that it was the CIA almost certainly that killed my uncle. The best reading that you can do on this, the best source of information is a book called uh, The Unspeakable by James Douglas. And he's done an extraordinary, he's a scholar that's, uh, who's done an extraordinary job of distilling probably a million pages of documents and many, many, you know, I think over 20 people have, uh, who were involved in my uncle's assassination have given confessions. Now, a lot of them were deathbed confessions. Uh, but the evidence is, I'd say, beyond any reasonable doubt that the CIA was involved in that murder. Um, going just to, to complete the thought that we began with, the smith Mullen Act made it illegal for the CIA to propagandize Americans. But right after that committee, during those committee hearings, we learned that the CIA had an operation called Operation Mockingbird which had recruited 400 American reporters, including senior editors at the New York Times, the Washington Post, at ABC, CBS, and all the major news outlets who were working for the CIA and who were propagandizing American people. And the CIA at that time, when this became exposed, and the, the, you know, the best thing to read about that is an article in 1983 that Carl Bernstein who was one of the Watergate reporters in 84, I think, uh, did for Rolling Stone, where he goes through all of the assets that the CIA owned, the Amer how the CIA was controlling the American press. After that came out, the CIA said, we're not going to do it anymore. Wow. And they, But they're still the number one funder of journalism around the world. They do that through USAID. So they, they spend $10 billion a year controlling journalism in Africa, Asia, and Europe. They own many major magazines, newspapers. They have assets in all these countries. And in 2016, President Obama um, issues an executive order that, in essence, repeals, in effect, repeals the smith munt Act. Now, the CIA, once again, was a, now allowed, supposedly, um, to propagandize Americans. And, you know, there's been many, many articles that show how the CIA has gained control of some of the major journals in our country. There's a wonderful set of articles by um, Dick Russell, the historian, who shows uh, that the CIA now controls uh, Daily Beast, Salon, Slate, um, Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone, which is, you know, the big counterculture. Yeah. A magazine is now run by a guy called Noah Schlackman, who is, um, you know, who is a intelligence agency asset and, uh, and many, many others. It's incredibly fascinating. And there's so much more I wanted to talk to you about, including you mentioned Obama <laughs> there. I wanted to ask about President Obama and what he did with bioweapons to uh, prevent some things that were going on on home soil, particularly in Texas and North Carolina, how those moved overseas, how that plays into what's happening in Ukraine and with it. I, we could talk all day, and I'm so sorry we didn't, because uh, I know I have to let you let you go. We didn't get to talk about falconry either, but uh, we'll do that some other time. I'm so fascinated by by falconry, but I want people to go to your website because you very clearly describe your policies, uh, economic policies, uh, health policies. Um, you talk about all these different uh, things, and and the border. If people, if, I think it's it's between 15 and 20 minutes. The video that you do on the border is probably uh, the most thorough and concise, being just, just short of 20 minutes, I believe, um, uh, description of what's going on down there and how to deal with it than I've seen seen anywhere. Um, and I think I, I try to stay up to date on, on a lot of these things, but um, I, I encourage people to, to go there, watch that video in particular, watch all the other ones to get a good idea of, of your platforms, your priorities, um, the, the health policy, is fascinating uh, and what you say at the end of that that video about uh, not reelecting you if uh, if you haven't um, haven't dealt with uh, the chronic health issues uh, in the country but once again didn't get to pretty much uh, most of the things that I had written down here but we'll we'll we'll, we'll catch up on it all some other time because I know you have to go and I've already kept you over but um, 
what are the things that uh, you'd like to leave this audience with as you move forward here? And I know you have a paper, uh, your policy no, uh, on Israel coming out soon in the next the next few days. Maybe by the time this drops, that'll be that'll be out. But uh, what do you want to leave uh, viewers with? You know what, Jack? I'd love to come back and and talk some more. Why don't we do that? Like after my Israel thing drops, and I I'm I'm planning a trip to the border that I was going to invite you on down to the Darien Gap. So I wanted to see if you want to spend oh, wow. a couple days down there with me. Wow, uh, and I, that'd be amazing. Um, Jack, thanks so much for having me. It really, it's just a treat for me. And, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Let's do it. Let's do it. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you and uh, and your family for everything that you uh, have done through. Uh, we have a middle child with really severe special needs who needs 24-7 full-time care forever. Everything your family has done with Special Olympics and American Disabilities Act. And uh, that just means so much to me and my family. So I wanted to make sure that I that I thanked you and your family. Thank you, Jack. Absolutely. You take care and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you for your service to our country and your, you know, your, your, the inspiration you've given to so many of us and uh, the terminal list and every, you know, all of these incredible contributions to literature. Thank you very much. I oh, appreciate that. Take care and we'll uh, hopefully we'll link up in person here soon. I've been a fan of Black Rifle Coffee Company since their inception. I love when veterans leave the military and pursue their passion. In this case, coffee. The coffee is fantastic, and as an added benefit, the company is built on quality, patriotism, and giving back to the veteran and first responder communities. I've been a subscriber to the BRCC Coffee Club for years and love it. My favorite is Silencer Smooth. It gets delivered every single month. The Black Rifle Coffee Club. Being part of the club gives you the power to elevate your coffee experience to the next level. The Black Rifle Coffee Club puts you in the driver's seat. You pick the texture and the roast you want, the frequency you want it delivered, and the quantity. You get to completely personalize your club orders, ensuring that your favorite coffee is sent to your door exactly how you want it, when you want it. Right now, Black Rifle Coffee is offering an exclusive opportunity for new coffee club members. Join today and enjoy 30% off your first order when you use the discount code DANGERCLOSE at checkout. That's right, 30% off just for being a part of our growing coffee community. Remember to use the discount code DANGERCLOSE at checkout. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. Going to start right over here with this Vault-Tec safe. I've been wanting to try one of these for a long time, so I'm fired up that this has arrived, and that is vaulttechsafe.com. So thank you guys so much for sending this. And what is this? This looks like an indestructible belt made in the USA, veteran-owned and operated Max Belts. So that is maxbelts.com, and then max underscore belts on Instagram. But this thing, it just seems like a weapon in and of itself. So I'm fired up to give this a run. So thank you so much for sending this. And I understand Norm Hooten has one of these as well from Hooten Young Whiskey. And uh, yeah, I'm good company with that. So sincerely appreciate that. And Patrick Scullin, look at this, at Patrick Scullin. And check out that artwork right there. Has a Winkler Tomahawk in there. And what? Little Magnum P.I., Solid. So thank you so much for sending these along. These are awesome. And uh, Patrick Scullin. And blades. Got a couple blades today. But this one, ooh, look at that. So this is from Doc Schiffer, S-H-I-F-F-E-R, Doc Schiffer Knives, at Doc Schiffer on Instagram. And even put a little trident on there for me. So very cool. This thing is pretty killer. So thank you so much. For passing this along and since i'm on knives montana knife company oh look at that love what josh smith is doing up there at montana knife company this thing i think it might be the biggest uh, montana knife company blade that i have there might be one that's bigger but regardless this thing's pretty solid so thank you for sending this along and check out montana knife company follow them on the social channels and sig oh yeah so right here this is the p210 Oh, 
Love this. And if you read the last novel, Only the Dead, you might remember that this was in there. One from Bruce Gray, Bruiser Industries, uh, which is not what this is, though I think I have one of those coming. But the 210 just feels nice. A lot of great history right here as well. So thank you, Sig. Check them out. And Schnees, Schnees.com. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I've been wearing Schnees boots for over a decade. The granites are the ones that I like to use when I go into the back country and plan on coming out heavier with something on my back. But uh, I have a, quite a few of their boots now. And this is a, a new pair that I just picked up last weekend up in Bozeman. And I'll be check wearing these this, uh, this winter around town here in Park city. So check out Schnee's. And if you're passing through Bozeman, you can go in there, get fitted for a boot. They're so knowledgeable when it comes to footwear and socks. I picked these up as well when I was in Bozeman uh, at the Schnee's store, which is an amazing store, by the way. So for sure, go in and check it out when you're there. Uh, but these are Duckworth socks right here. And uh, I've been wearing the Duckworth stuff. I think I got my first uh, Duckworth uh, shirt probably 10 years ago as well. And uh, maybe, maybe seven or eight, somewhere along there. But, but I love it. Awesome. I've been wearing it skiing for a long time. Great base layer, but uh, check them out. Looking forward to giving these socks a run as well. And if you can't make it to Bozeman, just give Schnee's a call and tell them what you're going to be doing and uh, uh, where you're going, what time of year, and they'll talk you through all the different boots and get you taken care of. So Schnee's.com, check them out. And huh, the second Magnum reference of the gear segment right here, whoo R Watch Co. So that's what it is on Instagram, R Watch Co. And look at that. This is, oh yeah, the Magnum. And no, it's not, not the Rolex, but this is their version. A uh, little Magnum Vive Seiko right here. And awesome. I wore this all last week. Absolutely love it. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you've been following me, you know that I'm a watch guy, obviously. And G-Shock right here, the book. But uh, this thing's Pretty sick. And a little nod to our Vietnam era seals right there for those in the know. So check them out. Once again, that is our watch co on Instagram. And it came in this cool little case. Awesome. Well done guys. Very cool. And whoo -whoo, at book signings, I tend to get a lot of honey and whiskey and, uh, the, Please don't stop, by the way. But this is from Bondurant Brothers Distillery. I was in Virginia last week doing a book signing and a talk at the Virginia War Memorial. And somebody dropped this off, and I sincerely appreciate it. And I'll be cracking this open tonight. So very cool. Bondurant Brothers Distillery, Virginia Straight Bourbon Whiskey. So give them a look. And let's see. Since we're on drinks, Black Raffle Coffee Company, this is the Gothic Serpent, and you can sign up for their signature coffee club, and look at that, different coffee every month, and also comes with a sticker and directions, so you know how to make it different ways, look at that. Oh yeah, Black Raffle Coffee Company, check them out, and they also have a sticker club for the sticker people out there, and this is Black Raffle Coffee Company, Born Primitive this month right here. So Black Rifle Coffee Company has been drinking their coffee for a long time and absolutely love it. So there we go. And Los Angeles Police Department, Venice Narcotics Division right here. And man, thank you guys for sending this along. Mike, really appreciate it. Everybody that wears the uniform out there and holds the line, sincerely appreciate all you do. And uh, this will go in a special spot. So take care out there. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. And moving on, oh, ta -ta -ta -ta. here we go. So this is Dynamis, ho, ho, ho. the combat flathead. And right there, they might be all sold out by the time this drops, but look at that little Gen 2 uh, Jack Carr Dynamis Alliance collaboration. And right there, cross tomahawks, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but right here, love this thing. This thing is indestructible. James Reese uses it in my novels. Dom Rosso designed this and we were at SEAL Team 2 together a few years back and yeah, every American needs one. 100% made in the USA. And also comes in this box with stickers. And moving on to Watches of Espionage. Follow Watches of Espionage if you're a, a watch guy. Um, you don't even have to be a watch guy. You can be into intelligence and military. Uh, but Great newsletter. Absolutely love reading everyone that comes out. And look at that. This is a 
band right here. And so we're doing amazing stuff right there. Look at that. It can open beers. Oh, yeah. Or sodas. But uh, thank you guys so much. Watch his best Be sure and follow them and sign up for that newsletter. I absolutely love it. And there, there they are. Watches of espionage. And what else do I have here? Navy water polo, you guys. Thank you so much for sending this stuff along. Really appreciate it. And uh, keep crushing out there. Look at that. Navy water polo. Awesome. And because it's Naval Academy and some will be going on into the Marine Corps. Look at that one right there. Navy water polo. Solid. Uh, almost there. What is this? Eric Bishop, my friend, his uh, latest book here. Ransomed Daughter, so uh, from the author of The Body Man. Eric, thank you so much for sending this, and you were very thoughtful. This is the third Magnum reference. What? Oh, yeah. So pretty cool. Eric, thanks so much for sending that. Really appreciate it, my friend. And since we're on books, it's not out yet, but it's coming. Finally, uh, the next Terry Hayes book. So if you read I Am Pilgrim and loved it, and you were waiting for the next book to come out the next year, been about a decade or so. It is out or coming out. And this is the galley copy. So this is an early edition that I am very fortunate enough to be able to read. And it's called The Year of the Locust. So I uh, can't wait to dive into this. I've been waiting for a long time, as have many of you. Super excited that this is now out. So Terry Hayes, The Year of the Locust. And if you haven't read I Am Pilgrim, there's a chance for you to read that before this comes out in early 2024. So um, please do. And... Christian Craighead uh, illustrated Matthew Klein, The Wrong Wolf. If you don't know who Christian Craighead is, you can uh, just use the Google machine and find out what he did in Nairobi a few years back. It's absolutely incredible. He has another book that may or may not come out. We shall see. And uh, when it does, he'll be coming on the podcast to talk about it. So uh, check it out. The Wrong Wolf right here, SAS operator. Um, did some incredible things in Nairobi, Kenya a few years back. So be sure and check it out and follow him on the social channels as well. And I did talk about the G-Shock book. This thing is pretty cool for those of us who went downrange over the last 20 years. Uh, at some point, there was probably a G-Shock on your wrist. So a uh, very cool book, a history of the G-Shock right here. And I think that is everything. All right. Until the next time. Take care out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., be sure and visit kennedy24.com and follow him on Instagram at Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and on Twitter X at Robert Kennedy Jr. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. Officialjackcar.com is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you got something out of this conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting. we've got here. Thank you all for coming out. My name is Matt LaFlum and I'm the National Deputy Field Director for the Kennedy for President campaign and the next President of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I'd like to recognize our State Director here, Jared Bowles, our State Coordinator, Laureen Dumichel, our Volunteer Coordinator, who's Will Smith, our field leader, Jason Harper. And we've got plenty of uh, county leads who I'd also like to recognize who are here tonight. We have Andrew Vanderbo, who's for, who represents the uh, capital area. In the Newigo and the Muskegon County area, we've got Patrick Bradley. Lapeer County, and excuse me if I'm butchering your, your county names here, guys. I'm from Maine. Uh, Lapeer County, we've got Sandra Schmidt. In Kent County, we've got Laura Jacob. In Emmett County, we've got Nancy Sherman. In Wayne County, we've got Afton Colleton. In Oakland County, we've got Daryl Johnson. In Royal Oak City, we've got two captains, Kath Hoosler and Phil Lease. 
And I'd also like to recognize Lisa Rod and Nicole Abador for making the volunteer badges for tonight. Thank you guys. And now, I'd like to introduce the Traverse County leader, Beth Roberts. Hello everyone. Welcome to today's community town hall meeting with a uh, meet and greet with presidential candidate, can, can, sorry, I'm nervous, <laughs> candidate Mr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. It's great, it's great to see all of you here and I love it there's enthusiasm, this is wonderful. Uh, as he said, my name is Beth Roberts and I am the volunteer lead for Grand Travers in the Illinois counties. <laughs> I was raised in a small, very democratic family and have voted as such most of my life. As late, I, like many of you, I'm sure, have become increasingly disillusioned with the political system in our country. Yeah. Feeling disempowered as our tax dollars are wasted on foreign wars and furthering corporate interests, all the while not helping American families. Yeah. That isn't <laughs> Mr. Kennedy first came to my attention during the height of the COVID crisis. His perspective was an informed, fact-filled, and welcomed one, and a beacon of light during murky times. When I heard the announcement that he was going to run for president, I was beyond thrilled. Each time I listen to him speak, I find just another reason why I'm positive he is the best and the only real choice for our country. <laughs> just a couple of these reasons, a couple of my reasons, uh, Mr. Kennedy's long and impressive career as an environmental lawyer, working to ensure that we have clean water, air, and food for our families in the future. His refreshing and inspiring commitment to transparency in government and telling the American people the truth. That he has concrete plans for economic reform and to secure our borders. And last but not least, his sincere desire to unite this country and heal the divide. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you all feel even more inspired after listening to Mr. Kennedy speak in person today. Please remember, we're not in this to win a fight. We're working towards a common goal to bring a life-affirming, inclusive, and supportive new era to this country and all of its citizens. I am humbled and honored to introduce our next president of the United States. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert F. Kennedy. System and the other day we did six in Charlotte, North Carolina or South Carolina. We did 600 people in 24 minutes. But, so we can we can get people out, but everybody has to kind of cooperate and keep moving and have your cameras ready. Um, I I was in I went in the campaign three weeks ago. Took me to San Francisco, and I um, I spent. Almost, I spent the better part of a year in San Francisco in 2018. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah. I, I spent the better part of the year in San Francisco in 2018. And because I was trying the Monsanto cases there, we tried three cases, one after the other, in front of, the, in front of two different judges. And, um, and so every day before court, I would go down to Union Square to go to the, to go to the gym. And Union Square is, for San Francisco, it's like Fifth Avenue to New York. It's the big shopping center. People come from all over the world to visit it. All the American brands like Nordstrom's and Bloomingdale's and Macy's and Gap and Old Navy and Levi. 
And it has the big foreign brands like De La Valle and Prada and Gucci and Burberry and Ferragamo and you know, every store that you can imagine. I went back three weeks ago and all of those stores are closed and it's just acre after acre of plywood. And it's extraordinary for me to see the destruction of a city that was my, my favorite city in this country and arguably the most beautiful city in the country. And, uh, and I, the reason all those stores are closed is because of the chaos in the streets from the homeless population. And um, so when I, came, when I left San Francisco, I began doing a lot of research on the homeless to f figure out why, why is it we have 525,000 homeless people in this country, but half the unsheltered homeless are in California, which only has 12% of the population. So why is that? My assumption was that homelessness was related to drug addiction, it was related to mental illness, to extreme poverty. Uh, I also kind of had this assumption that people go to, people who become homeless elsewhere, like in Detroit, or New York, and they don't want to spend the winter on the grates, that they would, it would make sense that they would go to San Francisco. San Francisco, everybody knows, has a very welcoming social service system. I had also heard that uh, certain cities like uh, Dallas and Austin, that the police, when they pick up homeless people, instead of putting them in, bring them to a jail, they put them on a Greyhound. to San Francisco one-way ticket. And people in San Francisco used to say that a lot too. Um, but I, I started researching it, and my son Connor introduced me to a researcher and writer called Matthew Desmond, who's written kind of a seminal books on homelessness, including a very important book called Evicted. And he actually worked with the University of San Francisco and went out and questioned, you know, did questionnaires with all the homeless in, in San Francisco. And what he found was that the people who are homeless in San Francisco, almost all of them came from San Francisco. They didn't, they weren't imports. They were people who had homes in San Francisco and then lost them. And that um, mental illness and drug, drug addiction, uh, extreme poverty have very little to do with homelessness. There are, there's more poverty in Detroit there's more uh, drug addiction in Detroit, there's more drug addiction and poverty, much more in West Virginia, and yet yeah, they don't have a homelessness problem, it's like in San Francisco. And what Desmond says is that 100% of the problem of homeless, virtually 100%, is the price of the housing. And California has the highest price of housing in the country. The average cost of a house in, um, in LA is 800,000, which means in order to own a house, you have to make 250,000 a year. And um, so what Desmond says, this epidemic of homelessness that they have in San Francisco is about to roll across the country like a tsunami because the price of the cost of housing is rising so dramatically. And uh, you know, this state, you have one point uh, when it was at the apex of, you know, of the automobile industry and everything, and the highest ratio of single-family homes to, uh, to residents of any state in our country. And it's important to have, to have home ownership because if you, as opposed to renting, to, if you own a home, you care about the community, you care about your police, you care about your hospitals, you care about your... Uh, your education system, you care about the appearance of your home, you care about your neighbors, um, and it gives you also a, uh, it gives you an entree to the capitalist system, because if you own the home, you own equity, which means you can borrow money. So if you have an entrepreneurial impulse, you can go out and, uh, you know, you can bet your home on it. You can buy something small like a sewing machine or you can build a restaurant or retail outlet and you have access to capital. And there was a period in American history that is called, the uh, economists called the Great Prosperity that began immediately after World War II 
when the American middle class became the greatest economic generator, the engine in the history of mankind. When I was a boy, our country owned half the wealth on earth, and it was because the middle class, and it, that great prosperity was kicked off by the GI Bill and a number of other pieces of legislation that made it so most Americans could get their own home. And that, you know, and it, it, it fortified our democracy and it made us a very wealthy country. And now we're going in the opposite direction. So the average cost of a home in this country two years ago was $215,000, two years ago. The cost of a home today is over 400000 And the interest rates have gone from 3 to 7%. So that home now costs four or five times what it did two years ago. I have seven children. My eldest, who's 39, has a home, and, and he beat this tsunami. But the younger ones aren't even, none, none of them and none of their friends are thinking of buying a home. How do we get a home? How do I, you know, how am I going to afford a home? This generation, you know, we broke in the big problem. The, Amer the promise of the American dream, the central promise, was that if you worked hard, if you played by the rules, you could finance a home, you could raise a family, you could have a summer job, a summer vacation, and you could put something aside for retirement. And on one job, on a single job. Um, there's nobody in my kids' generation that believes that that promise is good to them, that it's going to work out. They're worried about paying their student loans. And the chance of them getting a home is, uh, is just, you know, it's, it's very, very low. So why is this happening? Of course, inflation is affecting everything. And we know what the inflation comes from. It comes from spending $8 trillion that we didn't have on wars for the past 20 years. Yeah. Um, and now they're printing the money to pay for the wars, to pay $16 trillion for the lockdowns. And, uh, and that money, they don't, have, they don't have the courage to come and ask us for it through taxes. So they do a stealth tax, which is called inflation. But homes are going up faster than inflation, much faster. But why is it? It's because three giant corporations, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, have now, and one of their subsidiaries, Blackstone, which, are, which is co-owned by BlackRock and State Street, um, are now, have now, those three companies own 88% of the S&P 500. So they own the business of America. And they've now decided that they want to own the farmland and the residential housing, including the single family homes. And they've already bought up approximately 5%. If we stay on this trajectory within, by night, by, by within six years, they'll own 40 to 60%. And we're going to become a nation of renters. And it's driving the price of rent, the rents up too. But you know, if you're a nation of renters, you go from being citizens to subjects. It is a colonial model. It's a feudal model, like the one that we fought the revolution to get away from, where the oligarchy owns everything. And you know, we are living uh, by their courtesy, on uh, like serfs on their on in our land. And. Um, and so that, these, these companies now are now targeting that. Now, I'm running against two presidents who both are running on the idea that they brought great prosperity to this country. Um, they've each served four years consecutively in, in office. And I, you know, I spent a lot of time with regular Americans. And I, I did this, I've been doing that for the last six months, so I've been running. But I've been doing it my whole career. This is what I, you know, I'm representing right now a thousand families in Columbiana County, Ohio, who in East Palestine and uh, other areas that, whose lives were upended by the Norfolk Southern spill. I represented 
until recently, 10,000 families in Tennessee who were poisoned by zinc from um, from a, a lead from a, a lead smelter. I represent another 10,000 on the Ohio, West Virginia, uh, along the Ohio River, who were poisoned, poisoned by PFOAs from the DuPont plant. And you know, I I spent a lot of time sitting at. I spent a lot of time sitting at kitchen tables with people and talking to them about their lives. And if you tell them, most Americans today, that they are in the midst of a great prosperity, they think they're being gaslighted. Because nobody feels like that. Feel, people feel that the system is disintegrating. And they feel like their lives are uh, uh, are th th that they're disintegrating not just economically but mental health and physical health and in all these communities are, are are being torn apart in all these different ways and that they're living a lot of them are living paycheck to paycheck at the edge of desperation uh, the average income in America today is five thousand dollars less than the cost of basic human needs of food, transportation, and housing. That means if you get the bare minimum of food, transportation, and housing, you are, the average American is $5,000 in debt at the end of the year. And what are they doing? How are they, how are they handling that $5,000 deficit? Well, they're putting it on their credit cards. So three weeks ago, we passed an, an extraordinary milestone, which was a trillion dollars in personal credit card debt in this country. And the, the, by far the highest it's ever been. In the last three years, it's gone up 330 billion. And uh, they're paying 22% interest on that debt. Oh, if the mafia did that, they would, it would be called loan sharking and they'd go to prison. But, uh, and if Visa, MasterCard, MasterCard Wells Fargo, uh, Citibank, Chase, Morgan, if they do that, it's just business as usual. And who do you think owns all of those businesses? Every one of them. BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. So they're strip mining the wealth from the American public. You know, during the pandemic, um, you know, we shut down for three years. We shut down 3.3 million businesses without due process, without just compensation. They were just told to close down. But the business that wasn't was Amazon. So we all got it three year less we created. It, 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 the pandemic shifted $4 trillion in wealth from the American middle class to this new generation of billionaires, this new oligarchy we created in 500 days during the lockdowns. We created a billionaire a day. 500 new billionaires. And Amazon was probably you know, one of the greatest uh, beneficiaries of it. And Amazon, ironically, was, uh, you know, I did a book, uh, not the Fauci book, but another one with Joe Mercola, uh, uh, criticizing the lockdowns, and Amazon censored that book. Oh, Amazon was censoring critics of a government policy that, from which it was profiting by billions. We all got a lesson on how to learn Am how to use Amazon. I didn't know how to use Amazon prior to the pandemic. Um, I, uh, and you know, it's magical. It, it is, it, I, you just, you find a picture of something you like and you hit a button and it's in your driveway the next day. So, uh, um, but the, there was, there's a cost to that. And the cost is the, the local retailer, 41% of black owned businesses will never reopen. Some of those had three generations of equity in them. And the local retailers who paid taxes in this community are gone. Oh, these are the guys, this is you know, the guy who, who, who hired your kid during summer vacation. This is the guy who had a, a plaque on his wall from the local Boy Scout troop thanking him for supporting them. That is the, it's the guy who paid for your little league, your kids' little league uniforms and their hockey jerseys. And they're gone now. 
So, but at least uh, Amazon's paying local taxes, right? Right, no, it isn't. But at least they're paying federal taxes. No. How much did they pay last year? Zero. Zero. So they're doing it right in front of us. They're, they're just strip mining the wealth and the equity from the American middle class, which is the foundation of our democracy. Thomas Jefferson said American democracy is rooted in tens of thousands of freeholds owned by individual Americans and families, each with a stake in our system, each with a stake in our economic system, and each with a stake in our democracy. If you get an aristocratic system with these huge stratifications of wealth above and widespread poverty below, then you know democracy is simply unsustainable. Um, and most Americans today are making choices that they shouldn't have. 57% of Americans cannot put their hand on $1,000 if they have an emergency. If you are in that category and the engine light comes on in your car, it's the apocalypse. Because you can see your life circling the drain. You can see that you're not going to be able to, you know you're not going to be able to pay that mechanic. And you're going to lose your car and you're not gonna be able to get to work, and, and you're gonna lose your home. And that's what happened to all those people on the street in San Francisco. They, a lot of them, when, when you hit the street, within three days, you start to experience mental illness. So yeah, a lot of them went crazy. And a lot of them are drug addicts now. But they were just people like you and me who had a little string of bad luck and then the engine light went on in their car, or two, two flat tires at the same time. And, uh, and that's, you know, their lives began to unravel. And, you know, people that I sit at kitchen tables with are making choices. I talk all the time to elderly or their children who are cutting up pills to make the prescriptions, you know, last the end of the week so they can pay for food. People paying for choosing between home eating or home food. Gasoline and food. I have a kid who I saw the I talked to the other day, who said every Tuesday he makes a decision whether he's going to have a meal that day or whether he's going to buy gas for his car. So uh, I talked to a young couple who were sitting in a apartment that they could no a rental apartment they could no longer afford with a baby crying, their new baby crying in their lap and having to decide, arguing with each other about whether the baby was $50 sick or $100 sick or $500 sick before they bring him to a hospital. So, you know, we are, people are making desperate decisions right now that they should never have to make in this country. And um, I... I saw President Biden. I saw President Biden when he went to um, when he went to Hawaii recently, and he was he had come back from Vietnam, and it was on 9/11, and he was he gave a speech about um, he gave a speech about 9/11, and he said something that during that speech that I was rather uh, startled by, as he said that. The reason that they bombed, that Osama bin Laden bombed the World Trade Center is because he hated us, they hated us for our freedoms. So this is something that, you know, was a, was a trope that President Bush used at that time, and it was ridiculed by Democrats. And, because, and I went on Neil Cavuto the next day, and I said, that's not true, that's propaganda. It's just not true. We know, you know, Osama bin Laden was really clear about why he bombed the World Trade Center. He bombed it because we put two military bases right next to Mecca in the United States before that. He, because the United States had supported him in his war against the Russians in Afghanistan. Oh, and that he respected the United States and that it wasn't until we put those bases next to Mecca, which is, you know, the, the, which is offensive to uh, uh, to Muslim people. So that's their holy land. Um, so why would the president lie to us about that? Why would he try to say something that simply wasn't true? And um, I, went, I went to 
to Poland. It made me think of his trip I, I made to Poland in 1964 with my dad. And I grew up at a time when, uh, as I said, we own half the wealth. We are the biggest exporter in the world. Um, everybody wanted our stuff. When I traveled with my parents abroad when I was a kid, strangers would come up to me and offer to buy my blue jeans. They wanted American transistor radios. They wanted RCA controllers more than anything. Everybody wanted an American car. Wherever you were in the world, our cars were the gold standard of automobiles in the world. I went um, to Poland, as I said, in 1964 with my mother and father a year after my uncle was killed. With my mom and dad, three of the older siblings, and before we went, my mother took us shopping in Washington to buy gifts for children in an orphanage in, in Warsaw. We were very excited about it. We brought them clothes, American clothes, American toys. And, but when we got there, the communist government didn't want us there. They had, my father had been invited by a, a democratic activist, and they, um, they blacked out any news of our presence in Poland, because they didn't want the Polish people to know we were there. And when we took these gifts to give to the little children in the orphanage, the government had come in and removed all the children. And two days later, we went to Krakow to visit the cardinal, who was a living saint in the Cathedral of the Black Madonna. And he had resisted communism and the communists. He had been jailed, he had been tortured, he had endured this suffering with such extraordinary dignity and piety that he had inspired a, this huge religious resurgence in the Catholic faith in Poland. So, and everybody knew that as soon as he died, he was going to be beatified by the Catholic Church. So for us little Catholic kids, to be able to meet somebody who was a living saint was the biggest thrill of our lives. When we went up the stairs, we passed through Krakow Square, which was empty, one of the biggest squares in Europe. It looked like a mile long. And we spent about three and a half hours in the cathedral, you know, and, and meeting the cardinal at the end. And um, when we came out, there were a million people waiting for us. And word had spread by word of mouth that we were there. The entire city of Krakow had emptied out and come to see us. And our, the embassy automobile, which we were driving in, was trapped in this sea of people and couldn't move for hours. My father hauled us up through the window onto the roof of the car. And then he gave a speech to this crowd. Then they began singing Stolat to us, which means, may you live forever. And then they started singing another song that was described to me at that time as the Polish National Anthem, but it was a song that was illegal. It was an anti-communist song. It was a criminal act to sing it. And they just sang it again and again and again and again for hours. And I was a little 11-year-old kid standing on top of this car signing autographs for the first time in my life and watching people with tears flowing down their faces and, and just trying to get close and to touch, you know, some member of my family. And those are the same crowds I saw on that same trip in, in Germany, in France, in Italy, Greece, and England. They didn't hate us for our freedoms. They loved us for our freedoms. They, they looked to us for our leadership, for our moral authority. I, and one of the reasons that they were so passionate about us is because my uncle, and about my uncle, because he had made a decision, a strategic decision, at the beginning of his administration to project economic power abroad, but not military power. To, to in every place that he could, to project economic power. He, um, his, his best friend asked him, what do you want as the epithet on your gravestone? And my uncle told him, he kept the peace. He said the primary job of a president of the United States is to keep the country out of war. Okay. Okay, he said he didn't want African children, Latin American children, and Asian children when they thought of the United States of America 
to think of a man with a gun and a uniform. He wanted them to think of a Peace Corps volunteer. He wanted them to think of the Kennedy Milk Program, which gave nutrition to malnourished kids all over the world. He wanted them to think of, um, of uh, the Alliance for Progress, of USAID, were the programs that he had launched to put America on the side of the poor, to, to end run the oligarchs, end run the military dictatorships, go directly to the poor and try to grow middle classes in, in countries all over, because that was the foundation of democracy. And you know, three days before he took office, I was at his inauguration. I was at the Democratic Convention in 1960. But three days before his inauguration on my birthday, January 17th, 1961, um, President Eisenhower gave his farewell speech, which today we have to look back and say it was the most important speech in American history, as he warned us against the emergence of a military industrial complex. Uh, Form America, which was you know, supposed to be the world's exemplary democracy, the city on the hill, the lamp to all the nations, it would transform us from a democracy into an imperial nation abroad, an imperium, and a national security state, a garrison state, a security, a, um, a surveillance state at home. And my uncle, four months after he came into office, encountered that full force of that you know, during the Bay of Pigs invasion when the CIA lied to him and the Joint Chiefs lied to him. Uh, and he, uh, you know, he took the blame when those men were dying on the beach. He took public blame for the Bay of Pigs, but he said privately to his aides, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces. <laughs> and he fired Charles Cabell and, and he fired Richard Bissell, the three top guys at the CIA. And, um, and then he, he refused to go to war. He refused to send any combat troop abroad during his administration. He, you know, they, they were desperate that he sent them to Laos. They consider him a, a traitor when he settled that war with the Russians without firing a shot. They tried to get him into Cuba uh, in 61, Cuba again during the missile crisis in 62, uh, Berlin in 62 with the checkpoint Charlotte crisis. And then of course Vietnam, they, his, his closest aides, the people he trusted and loved, General Max Taylor, Avril Harriman, Bob McNamara, um, and others said to him, you've got to send 250,000 troops to Vietnam or the government is going to collapse. And he said, it's, it's their government and it's got to be their fight. We can help them. But we can't fight it for them. It's not our war. And um, he did end up sending 16,000 uh, advisors, mainly Green Berets, who weren't supposed to be participating in combat. Many of them did. And in October 22, 1963, he heard a Green Beret had died, and he asked Walt Rostow for a full casualty list. And when Rostow gave it to him, there were 75 Americans who had died already in Vietnam. And he said, that's too many, we're bringing him home. And that afternoon, he signed National Security Order 263, ordering all troops home from Vietnam, all military personnel, by 1965, with the first thousand coming home in December 1963, so a month and a half later. 30 days after he signed that, he was murdered. And a week later, President Johnson remanded the order uh, and, and sent 250,000 troops over. And, you know, my dad and, and, and you know, my dad ran again in, against Johnson, uh, was murdered himself on a peace platform. He, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, who by then had become a peace activist, was murdered two months earlier. Um, and Nixon became president, sent 560,000 Americans over there. 56,000 never came home, including my cousin, George Skakel, who died in the Tet Offensive. And, you know, uh, that trauma, those series of traumas, the death of my dad, my uncle, and my father, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, who was also a peace activist at that time, um, the Vietnam War, 9-11, and then the COVID crisis, this parade of traumas pushed our nation further and further down that path 
to becoming the, you know, what Eisenhower warned us against, a surveillance state at home and a military state abroad. And, um, you know, we're seeing that today, and we're all beginning to understand that the function of the intelligence agencies is simply to provide us with a constant pipeline of new wars at the, the military-industrial complex. So we spent $8 trillion on wars since 2001. Here's what we got for the Iraq war, which is half of that cost. Iraq is worse off than we found it. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. We killed between 650,000 and a million. Um, today, Iraq is in an incoherent battle between Shia and Sunni death squads. We pushed Iraq into a proxy posture with Iran, which is exactly the foreign policy out outcome we've been trying to avoid. We created ISIS. We drove two million refugees up into Europe. And that ended up with Brexit. And the, uh, the riots that are happening right now in France are a direct result of, you know, ultimately of our blowback from the Iraq war and the Syrian war. So, um, but we spent $8 trillion on it. And now we're putting another $113 billion in March to Ukraine, a war that could have easily been settled. The Russians tried twice to settle it on terms that were very, very beneficial to us. In both cases, we forced Zelensky to, to sabotage those agreements. It's a war that shouldn't have happened, that could have been solved with diplomacy. Um, we committed $113 billion. And that same, and now both houses of I mean, both Republican Democratic Party leadership with the White House has approved another $24 billion. And this is endless. This will go on for decades. So, uh, in, when we committed this money, the first $113 billion tranche, in March, that same month, we cut Medicare to 15 million Americans. We took away their health care. And we took away food stamps, we cut food stamps to 30 million Americans from $283 a month to $23 a month. I was in a food kitchen yesterday in, in Flint, and then, you know, people are starving in this country. And so when, and, but that same month also, the Fed printed 300 billion unanticipated dollars to bail out the Silicon Valley Bank. So when the bankers need it, and when the military industrial complex needs it, we got plenty, we got all they need. Just incidentally, the entire budget for EPA is 12 billion. We're, that's all we got for the environment in this country. For our Purple's Mountains Majesty, for our lakes, our rivers, and streams, that's it. We're sending 12 times that to you. My question to you is about marijuana. A quarter people in our jails in our country are people who are there for minor drug crimes, but many of them for marijuana, which is now legal in many states. What I've advocated is that we should legalize marijuana. We should have a federal tax on the marijuana that is designated specifically for drug treatment and rehabilitation. And I want to build as part of my presidency um, a series of renewal centers, of detoxification essentially centers around this country to treat the rise in mental illness and PTSD and drug addiction that is debilitating our children. We lost 106,000 uh, kids last year uh, to overdoses in the opioid overdoses. That is double the number of kids that we lost during the 20-year Vietnam War. Um, we need to start healing our country in, in many ways. I think the best solution is to legalize it, make it possible for the cannabis distributors to actually uh, bank their profits and their revenues and not force them to keep them in mattresses, which encourages more crime, and then tax it robustly so that we can pay for these, uh, you know, for the addiction treatment for our children. If you like this video and you want to learn more about me and the movement that we're building, please go to Kennedy24.com.